good to have all of you with us. So it's five o'clock. We're going to get our program started in just a minute here. So in case you guys don't know who I am, I'm Jay Kent Layton. I'm one of the co-authors with Tad Fitch and Bill Wormstead of the books On a Sea of Glass and Recreating Titanic and Her Sisters, A Visual History. So here's how we're going to proceed for the meeting this evening. Uh, once we get our program underway, we're going to mute everyone. You won't be able to unmute yourselves, but we're going to have a Q&A session at some point during the program tonight. And if you have a question, then feel free to put up your virtual hand. Its actual location depends on the device that you're using. It might be under reactions. That's a popular place for it to be hiding. So if you have a question, you can put up your virtual hand. And if we have time, we will um, call on you and we'll see if we can field your question for you, if that makes sense. So we're going to hit mute all. Here we go. So again, my name is Kent and Tad Fitch and Bill Wormstead and I, we are Titanic and maritime historians. Maybe you've met us before, maybe this is your first time, but we are very glad to have all of, all of you with us tonight. Hopefully some of you are familiar with some of our work that we've done in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll ask Tad and Bill so that they can unmute themselves and they can add to what I'm saying. So it's not just me talking as a talking head. But uh, the three of us, how, how long have we been doing, you know, Titanic research, guys? Can you? Well, the three of us together have been doing it for 12, 13 years. Tad, George Behe, and I worked on our article back in 1999 and 2000, our lifeboat lowering article. It's been a while. Yeah, longer than I'd like to admit as far as uh, time going by, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the years kind of get away from us, don't they? Um, it's it's really amazing. Um, but yeah, I remember when you guys did your uh, lifeboat article, I hadn't even met you guys yet. I knew, I knew of George by reputation, but I didn't know Tad and Bill at that point. And uh, little did I know that Come 2010, 2011, the three of us would be teaming up to do the unthinkable, and that is try to do On a Sea of Glass. That was a remarkable, very ambitious project as well. So I'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can see some of the work that we've done. And if Tad and Bill, since you're unmuted, you can give me a thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether you guys can see this. Hopefully everyone else can. Looks good to me. Yep. Same here. So this a lot younger though. <laughs> yeah, the, the picture's a few years out of date. I know it is for Tad and I as well. Um, but we've we've done a lot of work, uh, not just on Titanic material. Um, I know that Tad Fitch has been working with myself and Tom Linsky and Levi Rourke and Mike Poirier on uh, the forthcoming edition of Lusitania, an illustrated biography. That's something that we're really excited about. It's been done in conjunction with uh, the HFX Studios Virtual Museum Experience. It's being developed, which is called Lusitania, the Greyhound's Wake. And basically what we've done for that upcoming book is we've taken the older book that I had put out a number of years ago on my own, Lusitania, an illustrated biography. And we've paired that up with our latest research into the history of Lusitania, along with still images, some incredibly beautiful still images. We'll give you maybe a sneak peek of one or two a little bit later on tonight from the forthcoming uh, volume one. Um, and it's gonna be a two volume set. The first volume will focus on Lusitania's career, uh, her construction, technical details about the ship. Uh, it's really gonna be, uh, something that brings the ship to life, focuses on her life rather than on her sinking. And then volume two is going to come out either later this year or very early 25, we've been told by the publisher, in time for the anniversary. And volume two will focus on the war years uh, and on the eventual disaster and its repercussions in political history and whatnot. 
Yeah, Pat and I also worked on the Unseen Aquitania, the ship and rare illustrations together. Uh, that was a nice uh, publication that we did a few years back. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tad, but I believe the new edition of it comes out in, is it May? Yes, yeah, I'm finally back in print. And uh, on the topic of Aquitania, we have Mark Turnside joining us today, and he has a very excellent book on that subject as well, uh, The Ship okay. Beautiful, which I recommend highly. Highly recommend that book. I, I highly recommend any book that Mark Churnside has written. He's one of our go-to guys because he is a historian's historian. He looks through the archival material. He can uh, do critical thinking on the material. He can process it, sort it, tabulate it. Um, and he, I would say that Mark is probably one of the guys that, um, has helped further our own research on Titanic and other ships and putting all of that in context the most. So we, we very much appreciate having him with us tonight. Um, Tad, Bill and I also worked on uh, not just on a sea of glass, which everyone knows is published in 2012. And then uh, the third edition, I believe the current edition has been in print since 2015. And we'll give you guys a little bit of an update on the fourth edition and where things stand with that later this evening. But we also worked on recreating Titanic and her sisters. Beautiful, beautiful book. We were very fortunate to have uh, Ken Marshall do the forward for us. And we were very pleased to be working with a number of artists from around the world, uh, very talented, very skilled individuals, whether it was uh, Vasily Ristovic, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, or Chris Walker, uh, David Oliveira, um, so many different individuals contributed to making that book what it was in the end. And then, of course, we have the book that uh, is a little bit less well-known, which is Titanic Solving the Mysteries. We did that in late 2019 with a team of co-authors, historians, researchers, and we were able to bust a lot of myths in that book. Uh, we put the fire theory uh, to rest hopefully once and for all but of course conspiracy theories tend to rear their heads more often than we'd like and uh, we also learned a lot about timekeeping on titanic uh, and how the magnetic clock worked uh, that system and a lot of other things uh, especially as regards the marconi wireless transmissions during a disaster and that of course is available only through the publisher which is blurb books so this was the artwork that Vasily did for the cover of our book, um, really helping to bring the ship to life. So that's just a little bit of who we are and what we do. And hopefully you're familiar with our work at least a little bit. So we have a number of distinguished guests this evening on our program. So I've been doing enough talking to bore everyone to death to get us started. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to turn the program over to Mark Turnside, and he's going to do a presentation for us. So Mark, you have the floor, and if you can't unmute yourself, I've asked you to unmute. So there you go. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Hopefully that's uh, hopefully that's worked. You can hear me okay. Uh, thanks for the very kind comments and the plug for the uh, Aquitania book. Um, might be quite an idea, actually, to suggest to the publisher, maybe they can do a two-for-one offer and they can have one of each, so that might be a, might be an idea. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk uh, just a bit about watertight bulkheads and lifeboats um, and uh, do it hopefully in a way that's not uh, not too boring, but maybe just uh, add a bit of uh, context for people because I think this is a subject that there's often um, quite a bit of inaccurate or misleading uh, information about. Um, so if you're okay to fire up the presentation, um, thanks Ken, hopefully that will Work okay. Okay. Um, so if we could just go to the uh, second slide, please. 
Okay, so this is just it probably should be a standard warning for almost anything Titanic related. Um, don't Google it. Um, or if you do Google it, at least be very careful about believing, you know, what what might come up or kind of the, the, the first um, sources that you um, that you come across. Um, it's quite common that people will cite Wikipedia, for example, um, often seem to get it in various online discussions. And um, this is the entry. It might have been changed since, but this was certainly as it was last month, um, the entry for Thomas Andrews. And um, we have a, a few myths in there. Uh, in particular, at the end, um, there's a claim that Andrews had recommended there be 48 lifeboats for Olympic and Titanic, uh, recommended a double hull and watertight bulkheads going up to B deck and also the suggestion that these uh, recommendations were overruled by uh, others at Hand and Wolf or by uh, White Star. Um, in reality, there's no, there's no evidence for, for any of this. There's no evidence Andrews uh, recommended more lifeboats. Um, there is no evidence he recommended a double hull. Um, and for these purposes, um, we, we're talking about a double hull, really, as in a, a double skin or an inner skin. Um, because strictly speaking, that actually these ships, they did have doubled hull plating at uh, strategic locations. So um, in that sense, they, they did have a, a double hull. Um, and also in terms of the watertight bulkheads, again, um, simply no no basis for these suggestions. Uh, there is now a note on there, unreliable source with a query, um, but those uh, those comments are still on the Wikipedia page as far as we know. Um, it's an early port of call for anyone interested in the subject, and yet there's just no evidence to support any of these um, claims. Um, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please, Kent. Um, so this is just very quickly as an example, and um, this will form part of an article um, that uh, that I've got on my long long list of articles to do. Um, this is just as an example, just to um, set a bit of context. Um, this was, as we can see, 1903, so a couple of years before Olympic and Titanic were being designed, and this is a European uh, passenger line who had um, ordered uh, a number of uh, North Atlantic passenger liners from Holland and Wolf. And of course, they were going back and forth with Holland and Wolf, just discussing all the details, you know, what tiles you want in the smoke room, all that sort of thing. And one of the queries was about lifeboats. So um, the shipping lines query to Holland and Wolf was um, essentially that they wanted it, the ship simply to have lifeboats and not a mixture of lifeboats and cutters. So this wasn't a query about the number of boats, um, but they thought, well, we perhaps it's better to have all lifeboats rather than a mix of lifeboats and cutters. And the argument was that lifeboats are, are, are somewhat better. Now, Hand and Wolf's response, um, and I, I think actually it's been mistyped. It, it, it says at the end of the first line, the latter, I think it actually means the former. Um, but the response from Hand and Wolf is essentially that if they opted to have all lifeboats, so just standard um, lifeboats and not the smaller cutters, then um, the lifeboat outfit would be heavier, more expensive, and quote, we do not consider it worth the additional cost. And they also said it's, uh, it is quite unusual to have all boats fitted as lifeboats. Now, um, we don't actually know who it was at Holland and Wolf that responded, you know, this was a, 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 a kind of response um, that just came back on behalf of the shipbuilder. It wasn't signed by Piri or Carlisle or Andrews or anyone. Um, but I just use, use this as a citation. It's just an interesting example. We actually have a case here where a ship owner 
they're not talking about a greater number of boats, but they are saying that lifeboats rather than a mix of lifeboats and cutters would be better. And Harland and Wolf's response coming back is actually, we don't consider it worth the cost. So that's kind of the opposite dynamic to, um, you know, what uh, what many people might think with, uh, with Titanic. Um, if I could um, move to the next slide, Ken, please. So, um, it just briefly, I mean, you could talk about this for quite a while, but in terms of the regulatory context in 1912, uh, we have so much comment about the lifeboat regulations, you know, they hadn't been updated since 1894. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I think a much greater oversight was actually the regulations related to watertight subdivision. So you can see here at the top, William David Archer, um, there was no legal basis that they could compel uh, shipbuilders to make sure a ship um, uh, could float with uh, more than one compartment flooded. So if a shipbuilder designed a passenger liner, watertight bulkheads and so forth, even if that ship could only survive one compartment being flooded, that ship was legal, that ship could, could go to sea. Um, and, you know, I, I really think that is grossly inadequate. I mean, you can pretty much guarantee if there's going to be a collision, then it's going to be on a bulkhead and you're probably going to have two compartments flooded. Um, but there was a committee that Edward Harland had chaired. This was the early 1890s. And the highest class there um, was a ship that could float in moderate weather with any two adjoining compartments in free com communication with the sea. And that was the design spec for Olympic and Titanic. So Bruce Ismay said, they're very anxious indeed to have a ship which would float with her two largest watertight compartments full of water. And by the way, that was the same standard that Lusitania and Mauritania were designed to, also Holland America lines uh, Rotterdam. So uh, there's nothing, um, unusual about that. It was a higher uh, standard of the period. Um, if we could take the next one, please, Kent. Uh, in fact, um, this is the uh, design D concept that uh, Ismay and Sanderson approved at the end of July 1908. And there's just one particular feature I'd like to zoom in on. So if we look here at the bottom right, you can see that is what became Boiler Room 1 and Boiler Room 2. Now, oh, it's quite remarkable, actually, that they were originally going to be one compartment. So the original design concept that you have two, lo two lots of boilers, two rows of boilers in one boiler room compartment. Actually, that's the same as the aft uh, boiler room on Adriatic. Um, but by the time the design was finalised, they'd added a watertight bulkhead there. So actually, the uh, watertight subdivision was improved compared to the initial design concept. And um, it's not always commented upon, but the size of the watertight compartments was actually quite a bit smaller than on many other ships. So um, in proportional terms, the average watertight compartment on Olympic and Titanic was a bit over 6% of the ship's length. Um, that is better from a safety point of view because that compartment is smaller. So if a compartment is flooded, it's a smaller uh, proportion of the ship that's uh, open to the sea. And if we could take the next one, Kent, thank you. Um, this, of course, is Sam Halpern's um, work. And um, this uh, illustrates actually just how um, how safe these ships were, were actually designed for. What Hand and Wolf did, they went way beyond the specification. Um, they built in such a margin of safety. It, it wasn't just any two watertight compartments. There were a large number of scenarios where these ships could float with any three compartments flooded or even four compartments flooded. And you can just see here the amount of damage that they could survive. Um, and, you know, it should be emphasised, this is the original design, the way Olympic and, well, the final design, rather, how Olympic and Titanic were built when they uh, entered service. They were really uh, safe ships for the, for the period. And if I could take the next one. Oh, thank you. Um, and there was often... Um, a detail that gets overlooked, and that's actually how strong these watertight bulkheads were. 
um, when these ships were being designed originally, it was actually proposed that they'd be dry docked on a single line of blocks beneath the keel. Um, that required considerable extra transverse strength. So the issue was that the ships would be in dry dock. They'd be only supported by one line of, uh, of blocks. And essentially, Han de Wolf had to design these ships with extra strength so that the ship's sides wouldn't uh, drop. So um, there are certain features um, we can see from Wilding, for example. You look at the plating of the watertight bulkheads, that was heavier than Lloyd's requirements. So this is the classification society. The stiffening, um, in some cases, was double what was required. So these were really substantial uh, structures. And that's reflected in the comment that William David Archer made as well um, from the uh, Board of Trade. Um, there has been some comment about uh, the strength of these bulkheads. So for example, Olympic had uh, some of her watertight bulkheads extended in height in uh, 1913. And as part of that work, they also strengthened those bulkheads. Now, it can't be emphasised too strongly. They strengthened these bulkheads because those bulkheads were made so much uh, 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 higher. It was not a deficiency with the original design. These bulkheads were very, very strong for their intended purpose. It was simply that you had a bulkhead going so much higher and that required a greater strength once they had extended those uh, bulkheads to uh, B-deck. Um, if I could take the uh, next one, um, Kent. Thank you. So you can see here a letter from May 1912. Um, this came into Cunard from the Admiralty, and um, they... They don't actually mention Titanic. They just refer to recent events. And this, was, this wasn't uncommon um, in the summer of 1912. And they're essentially saying, well, uh, the watertight subdivision of Aquitania needs to be closely considered. And basically, can we do anything to uh, increase um, how well she is going to be subdivided? And they basically say, well, there's no reason to suppose the existing design is defective, but they just want to um, give it full consideration. So if they want to improve the design, they can do it at an early stage of Aquitania being under construction. Uh, next one, please. And uh, here we have a response here. This is June um, 1912. Apologies, it's creased. Um, and this was just confirming, actually, they had taken a decision. Um, this was actually under discussion in 1911. So it wasn't necessarily a direct result of the Titanic disaster. Um, it appears they'd already been considering it and had already come to that decision. Um, but Cunard, essentially, they just confirm that a number of the watertight bulkheads on Aquitania, they decided to extend them to D-deck. And at that point, they were talking about additional stiffening um, and also uh, making um, more provision in terms of watertight um, decks. If I could uh, have the next one, please. And um, just for a bit of context, so this is... Um, Aquitania um, as uh, as built. And you can just see here again, um, you know, uh, watertight bulkheads. Um, they're not hugely different to what was on Titanic. Um, you know, the, there's often this criticism, Titanic's watertight bulkheads should have gone right up to B-deck. Um, we can see in the Aquitania design, um, you know, in, in, in many respects, they're, they're really not that different. And this, of course, is with five of these watertight bulkheads that have been extended compared to the original design. Um, now, there are other features of Aquitania. She had longitudinal watertight compartments as well as transverse ones. Um, so I am grossly oversimplifying here and just providing this as a bit of context, just looking at uh, solely at the at the height of the uh, watertight bulkheads. I'd have the next one, please, Kent. Um, and here we have a uh, ship which became a, a White Star liner in 1922, but she was under construction in Germany for North uh, German Lloyd. 
uh, before the war, and um, quite a substantial ship. So she was 34,000 gross tons. So she was larger than Mauritania. Um, but we can just see on this capacity plan, um, just taking a look at her arrangements, um, she was designed to float with any two watertight compartments flooded as uh, as far as I've been able to uh, ascertain. Um, but again, you can just see here, actually, I think as constructed, the original Titanic design is probably somewhat superior to the uh, bulkhead arrangements that were uh, on this ship. So again, just to uh, provide a bit of uh, a bit of context. Um, and if we could have the next, thanks, Kent, the Majestic. So um, uh, again, um, this was a ship under construction. She was launched in 1914 in Germany. And of course, she became uh, a White Star liner in uh, 1922. Um, and we can just see at the top left, this is a, it's a very crude sketch in all fairness. Um, it just shows the um, basic um, watertight subdivision of the ship. Uh, the compartments are much larger than what was on Titanic. Um, so uh, you can make that argument again that Titanic's arrangement of transverse watertight bulkheads was actually superior in uh, in that respect. Um, and what we can also see there at the top left, there are actually two watertight bulkheads, which are marked at the bottom here with those uh, heavy, thick black arrows um, that uh, originally went one to F deck, one to E deck, and they actually had to be extended. Um, uh, so that was a change from the original German specification um, to uh, when the ship was completed uh, after the uh, First World War. Um, it, again, there's, there's quite a lot of detail I could go into, but just another example. You can just see there, this is a ship that's been completed after Titanic. And we can see again in terms of height of watertight bulkheads, um, you know, they, they simply don't extend as uh, as um what the equivalent of uh, of B deck would have uh, would have been, um, and this goes back to the Wikipedia uh, article at the beginning. The design specification was that these ships, Olympic and Titanic, needed to float with any two watertight compartments flooded. Well, that being the case, there were, and Hond and Wolf had already gone above and beyond that. There was simply no reason for Andrews or anyone else to recommend at that point that the watertight bulkheads would need to uh, to go up to B deck. Um, and actually, if we remember what Edward Wilding testified to at the British Inquiry, um, he also considered the often overlooked damage or flooding in Boiler Room 4. And he actually said that if Boiler Room 4 being flooded, as, uh, as was observed later in the sinking, no possible extension of the height of the watertight bulkheads could have uh, saved the ship. Um, so hopefully, you know, we've just looked at a few other ships being built uh, in the UK. So case of Aquitania, um, two German ships. Um, these are ships being built for Cunard, no North German Lloyd, Hamburg, America. Um, you know, it just gives a bit of context as to what other shipbuilders and shipping lines of the period was were working to, and just puts a bit of that uh, criticism of Titanic's original design into um, just into a, a, a wider perspective, if you will. Um, okay, I have the next Kent. Okay, yeah, this is this is just a a plug for Majestic. So if you're interested in Majestic's watertight bulkheads, you can read uh, read all about it in the new edition. There's some more pretty uh, diagrams and everything. Um, and if I could just have the final, there we go. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. So. I know that we didn't plan the uh, back and forth when we were planning this meeting out, but that was a lot of information there for our guests to uh, digest. Yes. So maybe maybe a, a brief recap, especially for those who came in to the meeting late, would be in order. So looking at Olympic and Titanic's original 1911-1912 bulkhead strength, 
watertight subdivision, ability to stay afloat with two, three, four compartments breached in various areas of the ship. If you had to summarize how Olympic and Titanic compared to their peers, even ones that were built after the Titanic disaster, how would you compare those two levels of strength, subdivision, uh, watertight integrity as designed for Olympic and Titanic? As designed, I think it was very much the highest, the highest standard. Um, you know, we see in so many features that they're actually better than um, also than other passenger liners that even were built in the 20s and 30s. Um, I really think that with the amount of damage Titanic received, that is the thing that it, it, it sounds so obvious and yet it's so often overlooked. Um, I really don't think that ships today, and I believe I've heard this about Queen Mary too, they couldn't survive that uh, amount of, uh, of damage as well. So, uh, and, you know, we look at the, the changes that were made to Olympic and Britannic after the disaster. Um, you know, they were really quite extraordinary after the disaster. I think they could float with, I believe it was 38% of their length flooded. Remarkable. Um, and yeah. Then, so, uh, I mean, and that was just way beyond, uh, I believe I'm correct in saying that was superior to any other, um, certainly any other large passenger liners that were that were afloat at that time. Um, so really, to sum up, I would say there was nothing fundamentally defective at all about the watertight subdivision. Um, the bulkheads were more than adequate for their design purpose. Um, they were particularly strong. You know, we've got examples there where uh, parts of the design would double uh, the strength um, that they uh, that they needed to be, and that was acknowledged. Um, so I, I really think that, you know, we need to bear that in mind when we're reading comments such as that on that Wikipedia article. And actually, all those statements there, no evidence to support any of them. And it very much conflicts with the evidence we do have as to the, uh, you know, the primary sources and the, uh, and the ship's design. Yeah. I think that's something that's so important for all of us to keep in mind because people look for a deficiency to explain the Titanic disaster. But the more you look at the original design of Olympic and Titanic, the strength of those ships as they were originally built, not the later... Uh, alterations that were made to Olympic and Britannic, but the original plan, the original strength, it becomes clear that they were remarkably well-built, well-designed ships, uh, exceeding just about any safety standard of the day, including, as Mark pointed out, uh, even many modern ships. So it's important for us, you know, you'll hear it still in documentaries, you'll hear it, you'll read it in books, even some very popular books by some uh, authors out there whose name is well known um, that, you know, Olympic and Titanic were built poorly right from the start. They were accidents waiting to happen. And when you look at the context, when you really look at things, that is just not the case. And unfortunately, anyone that is peddling that, um, that theory is not doing their homework, I'm afraid. So it, it can't, I would second uh, everything that Mark said. It, it, it's frustrating because this is one of the things I would tell anybody that's viewing to be very cautious about believing um, even experts uh, or established experts on claims about deficiency in design. And, and and besides all the things that have been talked about already, you go back and you look at how much damage and how many compartments were uh, flooding on Titanic and how stable the ship remained throughout the sinking until very late. Um, if it was a deficient design, that was not going to be the case. And um, it's just one of those things where that gets headlines when you claim they cut corners and that it was weak steel and this and that, and it, it just doesn't bear any any um, credibility at all when you look at the evidence and go back to the source documents. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, Ted. Okay, so thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we, we put Mark in our lineup usually when he joins us for these events. We put him first 
because Mark is in the United Kingdom, which is five hours ahead of our time here in the Eastern US. So we try to put him in early so that if uh, he needs to shuffle off and go to bed at some point, he can always do that. But uh, Mark, we hope you're able to stay with us as we move forward. And um, we really appreciate your presentation as always, your research and the context that you go into for these ships. It helps us out tremendously. Okay, so let's now turn our attention over to Joshua Anderson Raymer. Let me introduce him for you. Joshua is involved with the Titanic Book Club. I believe you are the social coordinator. Is that uh, correct, Josh? That is correct. And he is also working with us in the RMS Olympic Steinway Association as one of our board members. So over the past couple of months, I've had the privilege of getting to work with you quite a bit, Josh, and getting to know your research uh, a bit better. So why don't we give you the floor? And I know you have some fascinating tidbits to share with our audience tonight. <laughs> Certainly, certainly. Sounds good. Um, no, uh, my name's Josh, like you said, and then, sorry, this is my first time doing this sort of thing, so a bit jittery. Um, my background is more in military history, and so Titanic was always kind of off in the peripheral for me, and so it, it got my start in history was Titanic, um, and then most of my life since college, I've mainly, mainly focused on military history, and so... The last couple months, I guess, ever since I got involved with the, the the book club and then the the piano association was how can I kind of stake my claim in something? And I'm like, Titanic, we'll see if I get there someday. But um, one thing that did kind of catch my interest was the uh, cruiser and transport service from World War One. Now, this is going to be the ocean liner transports that brought our boys for the Doughboys over and starting in 1917 to France. And let me say it's it's been a rabbit hole of information that I've been going down for the last two months. Uh, last week, I started seeing dazzle paint in my sleep. And so um, been going through a lot of firsthand accounts, uh, cruise logs, war logs from a lot of these transports from World War One. Um, getting a lot of not personal information, but stuff that the crewmen saw when they were on board these ships. And so I've gotten some really neat stuff. And then it's also kind of allowed me to dig into stuff I had heard about from World War One, but hadn't really ever nailed down. And then, you know, lo and behold, these other ships, Olympic, Aquitania, all these well-known ocean liners keep making cameos in my research. And I'm like, all right, so where does this fit into the picture? Um, I guess one of the first things I might show is a uh, letter I actually just found yesterday. If I can screen share that really qu quick, Kent. I believe you have the authority to do that. All right, let's see here. And so this was a letter that I found written by General John Pershing. Um, I believe it's, it doesn't say, it specifically say who it's going to, but I believe it's part of the chief of staff in Washington, D.C. Now, basically the gist of the letter is um, stating that we need to do a better job of getting our guys to France quicker. And the problem they were running into was they were periodically, they were getting use of um, Olympic, Aquitania, Mauritania, but they wanted them more often because basically the agreement they had signed with the British stated that the, these three were exclusive to the, to that. They, they could be used when they were available um, basically is what, what the agreement said, but it wasn't that they would always be there for American service. And so basically this letter was sent by Pershing back to Washington, basically stating we need these three ships more often because they can hold so many more guys. And so just thought that was kind of an interesting little um, personal, you know, background tidbit to, you know, what these ships were doing in the war. Um, and then every once in a while in, in, books and stuff that I'll be researching um, a little bit of peripheral um, Titanic history picks into it. Um, I just recently found this picture about a month ago of the uh, tender nomadic 
uh, sitting in Saint Nazaire in France. Uh, it was currently it was at the time of this picture being used as a minesweeper. Um, the interesting you notice thing you notice is that it's still in white star colors. Um, they never. This is 1917 when this picture was taken. They've still not bothered to either paint it gray or in dazzle. So I'm guessing if they hadn't at this point, they weren't going to. Um, one of the interesting things you'll notice is it's one of the few pictures I've come to find out since I shared this picture is it's one of the few pictures you'll see with Nomadic with a deck gun on it. Um, this was taken from the, the uh, transport Kroonland uh, coming into San Nazaire. And then... Let's see here. A couple other things I thought I might share real quick. I'm not, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know we're we're talking about Titanic tonight. Um but one of them was going to be oh, it's hidden by the bar. Let's get it little bit. Uh two of the ships that I've been involved heavily involved in my research were the SS Great Northern and Northern Pacific. Now these were two ocean liners built in the States in um, 1913. They were finished in 1915. Probably some of the most premier ships we had in the United States that had been home built at that time. Uh, top speed 23 knots. Um, triple screw, uh, believe it or not. Where did that picture go? Yeah, if you can see that there. Um, apart from the the ships being Barton, built in Harland and Wolf to you know triple screw, these one of the few ocean liners I've seen that also have triple screw. Difference being these were all turbine driven, um, all turbine driven water tube boilers, um, top speed twenty three knots. Um, these were the only two ships that could keep up with the um leviathan during world war one um i have two accounts of uh two convoys that these ships were involved with with leviathan um heading to france where they actually sailed together and it's the only time you'll ever see leviathan traveling with another ship because those were the only two ships that could actually keep up with her now the funny thing is leviathan's log states when they ran into a storm on the second trip the other two fell back because they were much smaller and couldn't keep up with them in a heavy sea um but they did their part and so no that was kind of neat um as well as just yeah we'll see where the research takes me i i think there's quite a few more surprises in store for everybody so stay tuned thanks guys thank you josh um it really is remarkable i mean uh, when you think about Titanic sank just two years before the start of the First World War, and basically all of Titanic's contemporaries and the ships that came into the picture within the next couple of years after that, they were all kind of caught up in, in that World War. And it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, how would Titanic have fared if she was still around in 1914? Would she have had the encounter with U-103 that Olympic had? I believe that's the right U-boat number. I'm sure Tad will correct me if I'm citing the wrong U-boat number. Would she have had that? Would she have been torpedoed? Would she have uh, sunk in a minefield? Um, but it's always good. And this is, this is the important thing that we always try to emphasize. You don't just research Titanic. And you don't just research Titanic, Olympic, and Britannic in a vacuum. You always do research to the larger story so that you can compare the stories of these other ships and their strengths, their weaknesses to Titanic so that you're looking at a level playing field uh, because that's the only real fair way to, to look at Titanic. And it's, it's amazing to think about where she would have been just a couple of years afterwards. So we wish you the best with your research, Josh. And uh, we hope very much that uh, you're going to have some nice surprises for us down the road. Thank, Thank so. you very much for that. You bet. Okay, so now at this point, uh, Tad and Bill and I were going to talk for a few minutes, and I hope you guys, there we go, unmuted. We were going to talk to our guests this evening about something that you've probably all heard at least a tease about, but we wanted to talk for just a few minutes about the changes to Honesty of Glass for the impending fourth edition. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Tad um, and Bill, we 
started these corrections, a list of these corrections, was it three years back? Four? Something like that? That yeah, sounds I, roughly correct. Yeah. And, and just for the, the viewers um, to know that, that we're always looking at our own research and taking feedback from fellow researchers about things. So we officially, like like Bill just said, have started this for several years, but um, we mark down things as we find them and as we evolve and and we we view our work as not static. I mean, a good researcher or historian, you don't ever take everything that you've concluded as fact 100%. You always are looking to make sure it's right. And when new information comes to light, you want to revisit and uh, assess what your previous conclusions were and, and change them if necessary. Yeah. I think if you're, as a Titanic researcher, as a historian in general, if you're relying on work that you did 20, 30, 40 years ago, or work that others did even before that, and you're taking that as gospel, it's it's very static. It's It, it will quagmire very quickly. Uh, whereas if you're continuing to do your homework and do your research, you're always going to be learning new things. Um, I remember one of the things that we found in 2019 when we were doing Solving the Mysteries was... We learned a lot about how they changed time on board those ships every evening and how those magnetic clocks worked at the time. And it led us to go back to on a sea of glass with fresh eyes and say, you know, we need to, we need to revise that because we know what the time changes were, but how they did it is completely different than what we had thought before. And so it's always this kind of learning process for us. And I don't think there's any conclusion that we've ever drawn that we haven't always been willing to go back and reassess in light of the latest research. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a fair assessment, guys? Yes. And if, if Bill um, would like to speak to this, uh, one, one small example, one of the things that we're looking at in On a Sea of Glass relates to the placements of passengers and crew members in lifeboats. And Bill, I don't know if you wanted to plug the lifeboat project and how that's impacted what we're looking at in the text. Um, oh, geez. Ten years ago, George B. he started a project <clears throat> for a number of us to pool our resources to um, figure out who was in which, which lifeboat. Unfortunately, that project kind of petered out after a little bit. But about four and a half years ago, Tad and I and eight other respected researchers started looking at it again. And we finally completed our work late last year. And if you go to uh, my website, which is wormstead.com slash Titanic, you'll see a number of articles and you'll see the results that we came up to. And... A number of people were not in the lifeboats where people seemed to think they were. Um, we were coordinating all the accounts, trying to fit them all together. Um, uh, we ended up with about 80 survivors that we have no idea what lifeboat they got off. They, they didn't leave any accounts or what account they did leave. They didn't give enough, us enough information to actually nailed down which lifeboat they were talking about. Um, but we got all 712 survivors along with another seven people who died in the lifeboats. Um, uh, there were several people uh, who died in collapsible A and their bodies were found uh, a month later when the Oceanic found the collapsible A there were three bodies in it, and one of the, we know what one of the bodies was. It was Thompson Beatty. Um, but we went through everybody that was in the lifeboats and tried to place them as much as we could, and we gave estim in we gave estimates as to how sure we were of our findings. If a passenger, if we're positive, a passenger was in lifeboat six, for example. If we were positive, we gave them a 5.0 rating. If we were kind of shaky, then we'd give them a 3.0 or a 4.0. And if we had no ideas, we gave them a um, a 1.0 because we just didn't know. And we have been examining 
new accounts that have come up since we published. Um, we've made a few uh, minor changes to our list, um, th What you'll see on the website is current. And if we get more accounts, we'll update it again. Yep. And, and as we've been going through on a sea of glass, this uh, is just a small example because there's some cases where that doesn't impact a finding. It's just a correction for the record. But we found some cases where there are some things that we looked at a little bit differently because um, now knowing which lifeboat the individual was in, it's reinforced or caused us to reconsider some of the other details. But um, it's definitely been a very lengthy process. And I, we have to caution, like we don't have official news on when this is coming out from the publisher. That's an ongoing conversation and talk and what scale they're going to allow us to to present these revisions in. If it's just another printing with corrections or something more extensive, we're hopeful that that's going to be something because there's clearly a lot of interest. But um, it's been something that in you figure we we first published in 2012. It's now been over a decade, and and there's really a lot of things that have come out um, since then that we never would have thought would have existed as far as documentation, things that really caught us off guard and forced us to reconsider some of the details, which is um, a good thing. Yeah. We and it's still happening. Mm -hmm. Just in the last month, um, we received some information from uh, uh, Brandon Whited um, uh, about an article he's going to have coming out in three months in the Voyage magazine. Um, I'm not going to tell you what, what his findings are or what it has to do about it, but it made us go back to, to honesty of glass and make some changes. Yep. And that was just in the last two months. Yep. And uh, although we've been set back on our heels a bit the last month or two from trying to wrap up the Lusitania <laughs> book and uh, from me having COVID, um, we, we've been working very hard. I mean, our first list was probably three, four or five years back. It was just like a one or two page list. And then the list kept getting longer and longer. And finally we decided we, we have to actually just go in and, and go from scratch and reread the, the book as if it's with fresh eyes. And, you know, there, it was amazing how many times I, I would read and I would be like, Oh, I remember we, we found something else about that. We need to revise this. We need to revise that. Or maybe the, the wording, maybe we could make it a little clearer. Or maybe we could go back and say, mm, maybe we need to refine that wording slightly and, and be a little more non-conclusive about this or that. So we've been, we've been working at this for quite a while. And uh, we don't know where it's going to go from here. When we're done with our list of corrections, which are extensive, it's basically rewriting a 300,000 word book. When we're done with that list, then we go to the publisher. And as we all know, we all, everyone wants hardcover. Everyone wants more color pictures. Everyone wants larger text because they have difficulty reading the text and honesty of glass. And unfortunately, that's not something that we have control over. Um, I know that when we go back to the publisher, as Tad said, we're going to have some extensive conversations with them about formatting, uh, about the scale of the revisions, about what new content we might put in that readers would enjoy. Um, so we're probably looking at, my guess would be a, at least a year from going to publication with the fourth edition. It's a slow process, but that's where... Uh, the patience factor comes in. We know everybody wants to read the update. We know everybody wants a different format, but um, we want to get it right. Because we going into a fifth edition, we, we want to make minimal changes going forward rather than an extensive list. I know Bill is constantly saying to us, well, this is our last big change that we're going to do for, for the near future. So we've been working very hard on that. And uh, Hopefully in the next year or so, you'll have news on publication. So make sure to uh, like and follow our page, whether it's Atlantic Liners or on Sea of Glass, Recreating Titanic, and we'll keep you guys all posted on that. So and, and I would say I, I, we are not going to give away the goods on some of the more significant things we, we are incorporating, but just a little hint without um, giving that up yet is that there's some conclusions we had in the first book that were what we consider pretty groundbreaking and different than what's been portrayed in movies. And we've actually found some things that have 
further reinforce some of those conclusions. And I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to spoil all the surprises at this point. But of course, in the meantime, we continue to recommend the third edition of Honesty of Glass, the one that is available through Amazon, Amazon UK, and other uh, retailers around the world, including the publishers on website. Uh, that is the current text. That's what is available. If you have trouble reading the font size, we also recommend the um, Kindle edition or the EPUB versions. Although we also have realized that what's available digitally is actually the second edition text. So there were a few improvements between the second and third edition that if you go with the digital edition, you won't have. Um, so that's why we, we always recommend going with both so that you can compare the two. And um, the nice thing about the digital version is that at least on Kindle, the end notes are all hyperlinked. So you can bring them up and it's right on your page. That's nice. So stay tuned for details. We'll have more for you guys soon. Now, at this point, uh, we're going to turn the floor over to Patrick Vita. And Patrick is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some efforts that he and myself and Josh and uh, Christopher Mulholland, who's uh, with us this evening, too. We're all on the board of directors for the Olympic Steinway Association. So, Patrick, uh, take the floor and tell everyone about the work that we've been doing over the past few months to try to save this piano. Yeah, you have just unmuted me. Thank you so much, dear Kent. Well, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. This is Patrick Cornelius Vida talking to you from Austria tonight. It is a great honor, and I appreciate very much having been invited to talk uh, to all of you about what we have been doing for the last couple of weeks, despite the fact that we all were pretty sick. <laughs> whilst I can see that you have recovered, dear Kent. Uh, I'm uh, in, the, in the last stage of recovery from the strange virus I got, which was, was not COVID, but never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> and as far as your book is concerned, I would like to congratulate on you on all the work you have done, you continue to put in, and I would like to commend everybody's work and research here. It has been tremendously interesting so far, not a day goes by that I'm learning something new since I have joined this community the last fall. Well, um, I can also see a few gentlemen online here who might have received an email from me about three weeks ago. And for those who do not know me, um, I'm a musician from Austria, primarily a violinist, and I work in Germany in a full-time professional orchestra. I have been into Titanic for at least 30 years, I'm 39 years old. <laughs> and like Josh, it was the movie SOS Titanic, which got me started. What you see behind me is what I'd call my White Star Line Museum on a piano. This is my piano in my home. Currently, I'm not in my home, I'm traveling. Artist's life, as Johann Strauss would put it. And well, the story of our association and what we are trying to do goes like this. About one and a half years ago, I saw a post on Facebook by a German piano atelier claiming that a piano from the Olympic had just been rediscovered and uh, that they were starting to restore it. And the posting furthermore said that the identical twin of that piano, uh, which stood in the a la carte restaurant, um, most likely, <laughs> Kent has done a lot of work on that. The identical twin sunk with the Titanic. Well, I'm telling you this so calmly here. I almost fell off my chair. I, 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 I thought, what? I've been dealing with expensive and uh, ancient instruments all my life. And you guys are telling me that a piano from 1912 that traveled aboard the Olympic for 25 years, it doesn't only still exist, but has been restored. Okay. Uh, Kent, is it possible to share my screen? I believe I made you a co-host. No, I didn't. I, now yeah. you are, so you can go, go ahead. 
So everybody, I apologize for technical difficulties in advance because for the first time ever, uh, I'm joining a meeting on my iPad, but I've prepared something. Let's see if this works. Uh-huh, it should work. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, right. This is what they showed uh, in this Facebook posting. The piano, after about 70 years, in, an, in a private home in Ireland uh, and sitting at best broke pianos in Leeds until, and they didn't know which piano they actually had until somebody said, well, did you ever dismantle it? Take a look at the frame and look if there's a number 400 imprinted on it or something like that. Well, so they did. And they not only found the hull number, but also the serial number. And over the course, of a couple of months it was transported from the uk to germany and to poland and it was restored back to its former glory uh, using original uh, sketches and plans from 1911 or 1910 uh, the, the original white star lane copies which are now in the hands of collectors worldwide well they faxed them over to piano atelier Maywald, and with a lot of love, a lot of work went into the instrument to make it look like it looked in its heydays. Then, I, I, of course, I, I commented on that Facebook post. I thought, well, I'm in Austria. This is in Germany, probably less than a thousand kilometers away. Forgive me to calculating kilometers. <laughs> and very friendly, uh, I got an immediate response from Andre. Maywald, who happens to be uh, the current owner. This is the gentleman and this video. Und heute möchte ich euch einen ganz besonderen Gast vorstellen. Um wen es sich dabei September handelt, erfahrt ihr direkt nach 2022, I traveled to Dortmund or came in near Dortmund about 800 kilometers, let's say 600 miles. Um, I played, recorded three and a half pieces on it and You can find that on YouTube, by the way. Just type in RMS Olympic Piano or Patrick Vida Titanic, whatever, and you will see that first recording. Actually, there are no words to describe what this felt like. Um, it was like touching history when history uh, touches you. As a classical violinist, I not only play in the orchestra, but in a salon ensemble. And for 10 years, I've been playing repertoire from that Edwardian era. Um, my middle name, Cornelius, does not come from nowhere, if you know the Titanic's musicians. And so after this experience with Olympics piano, I went home in September of 22, thinking this was probably a once in a lifetime experience. And as a matter of fact, I, I kissed the piano goodbye. Um, Over the course of the next season, uh, talking about this, uh, the season of our opera house, um, I, it, it kind of didn't let go of my heart or my soul. I continued to practice. I am chained to the violin a few hours every day and I practice the piano in every free minute. Uh, and then last July, when my next holiday started, I, I kind of I had kept track of the instrument. And I had learned that it was retransferred from Germany, Piano Atelier Maywald, to Bessbrod Pianos Leeds. And the artist within me wasn't satisfied with the recordings from the year before. <laughs> I hadn't finished Bettina and other pieces by Scott Joplin, Bettina. So I just mustered up my courage and wrote an email to Bessbrod Pianos. And again, a very friendly uh, General manager responded, granted me a visit. And so I visited the UK last September on my birthday with a very dry British humor. I was told, oh, that's a very strange way to celebrate your birthday. <laughs> Indeed, I <laughs> was in Leeds on my 39th birthday. Well, and here you can see me one year later. Um, it sits in a building on the second floor from the Industrial Revolution with the most unbelievable co piano collection which I have ever seen. 
um, grand pianos from Richard Strauss, from Danish Kings, from World War II, from the US Army, you name it. And uh, in the middle of everything else, there sits Olympics piano, which is just like, you know, you have a lot of pianos there, but only one, one star, one sun. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to put to put into words. So I did the second recording, and this was the last photo saying goodbye to the piano again, thinking this was the second once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. You also find these videos on uh, on YouTube or on my Facebook page. I also traveled to Anik uh, the next day, but that's a different story. Uh, the point is, um, this gentleman here is Melvin Besbrode, one of the two owners of the piano. Now he gave me the tour. And the reason why our association is here, why the, the board, many board members are present, and why I'm here after all, is that this gentleman told me during my visit um, that they had been trying to sell the piano for one and a half years. It's a hundred thousand pounds. We're always talking British pounds here. And most shockingly, none of the great institutions out there uh, came up with a serious offer or expressed a serious interest in purchasing the piano. So it continues to sit there uh, waiting that Either uh, Patrick from Austria comes and plays another three pieces on it. Well, just kidding. <laughs> but they actually are failing to sell it. And after the publication of my first video from Anik, when I uh, performed in the lounge, the White Swan, uh, very friendly granted me that, I was contacted by Josh. <laughs> Suddenly, a Mr. Joshua Anderson Raymer contacted me from the United States, inviting me. Um, to speak at the book club meeting, telling about my story. And I thought, well, well um, isn't this uh, the, most, the most wonderful location? So I agreed. And whilst I was driving home, uh, you guys always have the advantage that it's your late afternoon. Now here it's already midnight. And it was the same three months ago. Or what, Josh, please correct me. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst I was driving there, preparing um, my speech in my head, I revisited the story I had been told. And suddenly, there was this fear growing inside of me that one day, a rich guy or lady might just drop by, a person for whom money does not play an important role, might just buy the piano and let it disappear into a private collection, just for the sake of being able to say that he or she owns it. Now, this was a most disturbing thought for me, despite the fact that I'm still astounded that none of the great institutions out there, associations, societies, museums, you name it, really expressed an interest to purchase the piano. I thought, Thousands of artifacts are on display. This, think of it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kent. I think you were the one who told me uh, we are estimating about 12 pianos on Titanic, on Olympic. And so far, this is the only one known to exist, um, having been identified, having been restored. The only piano out of 12, uh, I guess. There was uh, one that showed up in a newspaper report back in the late 90s. It was the D-Deck reception room piano from Olympic. What's amazing about that one is the fear that we have for this piano actually did come to pass for that piano. It disappeared. Yeah. Uh, we don't know where it, it went, and we don't know who owns it, and whoever knows is not talking about it. Right. So when Patrick says, you know, this, this is a fear that this piano could just disappear and be lost to public education, um, this is not a, an empty concern. This is something that very well could happen. So before I come to talk about the association itself, let's, let's stay back in, in November, mid, mid November, I think it was. And at the meeting, 
I, I for the first time expressed my idea. Well, if there is no institution out there that wants to own, preserve and maintain the piano for the public and for future generations, perhaps one should or could found it because I firmly believe that no private individual should own this instrument. It should be treated like Wallace Hartley's violin, like Olympic's clock, uh, like the first class lounge in Anik, you name it. And I'm still deeply irritated by the lack of interest of some. I have chosen my words carefully. And after speaking out loud, what I was thinking, Angela Harris, Angelica Harris was the first one <laughs> to approach me and say, well, I'd be honored to be working with you on this. Now the book club meeting immediately started to develop some ideas. Two days later, Josh joined the team. Uh, a day later, Kent joined the team. I remember writing to him, <laughs> welcome Mr. Layton, it's an honor. Uh, and I had forgotten that just a couple of days before he had already commented my videos on Facebook. Somehow uh, after the book club meeting, Chris and I uh, stayed in contact and I invited him to come aboard. And um, just a few days later, I had the high privilege through, uh, through Ken to invite Thomas Linsky as an honorary member and advisor to the board. I furthermore um, asked three of my Austrian friends whom I would trust with my life to found an association because in Austria, associations are legally very important, held in high esteem, run very formally and are legal entities. We have a board, we have bylaws, we have members, we have strict rules. So if we could manage to own the instrument as an association, we could ensure that no private person could ever go crazy and make the instrument uh, disappear or do however he or she uh, likes. We founded the RMS Olympic Steinway Association as a subsidiary of the um, Association for the Maintenance and uh, Preservation of Historically Significant Instruments, registered in Austria as a nonprofit organization. Uh, Josh Kent, Christopher, Angela, I myself, and three of my friends from Austria, we represent the board. And currently we um, consist of 35 members all together. The main objective is to raise the funds needed mm -hmm in order to purchase and own the piano and thus preserve it and maintain it for the public and for future generations and subsequent, subsequently place it in a semi-permanent home. It can be a museum. It can be a few museums over the years, not to move the piano around too many times, you know, the violin <laughs> is being carried every day, but I learned from Kent, no, I have known, of course, that this is what is the most dangerous part for a piano when you move it around too much. And I really have to, again, here in this meeting, uh, commend uh, Kent for his work and thank him dearly for the wonderful website um, he has put up. I invite you to take a look at rmsolympicpiano.com. Here is our mission statement. Um, of course, uh, we, everybody can donate either through the website or QR codes or whatever. So I um, sincerely um, ask you to consider um, supporting us. Even the smallest donation is highly appreciated. And I sincerely ask you to put the word out. There is our well, glorious team, the Glorious Nine. <laughs> I'm sure you are familiar with most of these faces, of which four are present uh, today. Our bias it is bilingual in English and German, of course. Uh, you have media up here where all the recordings I have produced so far um, can, be, can be heard and can be watched. Well, 
and what what it really has been exciting to me for for weeks now is the, the incredible uh, research in depth that Kent um, has come up with, uh, talking about the tale of two Steinways, of course, Olympic and Titanic, and which piano was put where in the a la carte and why and what happened to Olympic's first piano, where was it put on Titanic, then the a la carte was enlarged on Olympic, a second piano was ordered, our piano namely, um, and so on. So a, a fantastic, a fantastic uh, work that Kent has produced here. So and let me now stop the screen sharing. I think this goes like this. Okay. Well, in closing, this is what Kent, um, Chris, Josh, Angela, Thomas, and myself have been working on for about two months um, alongside our very busy schedules and catching all kinds of diseases in the cold <laughs> time of the year. <laughs> and um, I, I, it is still, it is still like a dream, you know. I mean, I, I'm a, I've been a musician all my life, and I have been into Titanic for thirty years, and it seems uh, a miracle what a single, what a single trip to the UK for only two days, uh, what, what change it can bring to one's life. And I'm still in awe of performing on the piano in the lounge, and it is like. Um, it is like a surreal dream to be working with so wonderful gentlemen like you, Ken, Kent, uh, Thomas, Chris, Josh, and Angela. I'm completely awestruck still, and I'm learning so much. So everybody, thank you very much for listening and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, please uh, seriously consider either to put the word out or to support us in any way. And if you have any questions, please always feel free to contact me either through the website or here in the chat or through Kent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, very much. As a quick note, just a couple of things I'll add to what Patrick uh, talked about in his presentation. Uh, many of you may not know that when I am not writing books, I am a piano technician and restorer and tuner. And in our small family business, we restore many instruments every year. Uh, pins, strings, keys, hammers, digital player mechanism and installs, we, we see them all. And they, uh, what's amazing to us is we've, since we started trying to get the word out about our association, we've had some very interesting responses from a number of people. Uh, some have said that the asking price for the piano is too high. Uh, I'll add to that that Steinways always sell for extraordinary prices, um, especially vintage instruments that have been restored by uh, Steinway technicians, um, Steinway approved technicians. And uh, Patrick, I'll, I'll cede the floor to you since you have your hand up. It looks like you have a thought. Now, I just forgot to add something, which is I think important. I didn't want to interrupt you. You may have well finished. Just wanted to add that um, we, are, we have an agreement with the current owner. Now, the actual owner is the guy from Germany, Andre Maywald, and Melvin Bestbrot is uh, somehow a very important figure. <laughs> and I just was told, after all, the three of us have to come to an agreement, the owner, Bestbrot Pianos, and our association. We have a, an agreement with the owner, uh, and we have one year um, to raise 100,000 pounds. We have... Uh, come to a good start, but we have also learned that, um, if I may say, posting uh, on social media alone uh, won't do the job. So right now, uh, Thomas, uh, together with Kent and Charles Haas, uh, is working on a video which will hopefully be done by the end of the month. I myself uh, have been given the honor to appear in that video as well. Secondly, we're working on some real patrons and third, we're planning a fundraising concert in New York this early summer where I will be present in person. But the important thing is, and then um, I'm done with that topic, we do have an agreement with the owner. He is in full support of our efforts. Uh, and of course, he's a businessman and not a museum, in, to quote him. 
And he's just a general up. salesman. That's what he does. And he, and in fact, Patrick, I'll add, he put the time and the labor into the restoration of the instrument. As I can attest to, that is an expensive thing to do. Um, so he, you know, he owns the instrument. He has um, every right to sell the piano because it's his and to name an asking price. And I think that the 100,000 pounds that we've negotiated with him is right in line with uh, many other historic Steinway instruments. I heard just recently that there was a, an auction house in the UK that uh, valued it significantly less. And I had to laugh at their valuation for it, knowing what Steinways actually sell for that don't have a Titanic connection. Uh, so everyone uh, should, uh, what we hope is that everyone can look at our association, look at our bylaws, our legal registry, uh, the fact that we're accounting for every penny that is coming in. Um, nobody's getting a free cruise off of these donations. We're trying to put together a deposit to hold the instrument, but we haven't met that threshold yet. And so we need everyone's help to, uh, to try to do that. So it's uh, 2024 is going to be the year of the Steinway. And we're, um, we're hoping that we will be able to save this instrument. So thank you very much, Patrick, for your input tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for granting me the time. Okay, with that, we're going to move into the Q&A part of our discussion for tonight. We had a number of responses that were submitted using the uh, Google form that we put together in advance. I think we have about six of them. And I know that our panel all had a chance to take a look at that. And I know a couple of individuals have a couple of answers they really want to go for. I don't know whose name goes with each question. Uh, but after we consider the ones that were uh, done online, then any one of you that has a question, whether it's about the piano, whether it's about the strength of Olympic and Titanic for Mark, whether it's about anything, um, that's where you can raise your hand. And if we have time, uh, we're going to call on as many people as we can, because that's usually where we have the most fun is the Q&A. So the first question that came in is, who would Titanic's captain have been if Titanic hadn't sunk since Captain Smith was due to retire? And I will open this up to any of our panel members who want to weigh in. First of all, Captain Smith's retirement is a very touchy subject, and there's a lot of opinion on there. Uh, one of the things that we find very interesting, however, is that uh, Smith was already himself involved in spreading rumors of his impending retirement. We know that he was telling people he was coming up on retirement. Um, he never seemed to say exactly when. Um, but we know that that was something that was out there. In fact, it's occurred to us, the, the dinner party that the Wideners threw on the last night of the crossing on Sunday, April 14th, in Captain Smith's honor, it's possible they were throwing that in response sort of to rumors of his impending retirement. We can't say for sure, but that's a thought that we had. We strongly suspect, considering what Cunard and other companies were doing at the time, limiting the age of their captains, we strongly suspect, you know, Smith was, uh, I believe he was 62 or 63. And on the form, actually, to clear, uh, I believe it was Titanic, he actually took his age back a year. So, you know, that's something that was on his mind. Um, so we're, we very much feel that he was coming down the end of the line. If it wasn't going to be after the maiden voyage, which we strongly suspect, it was going to be very soon after Titanic's maiden voyage. After that, then the question is, who would have been in line to replace him? I think one of the prime contenders, one of the first names that pops into my mind was Herbert Haddock, who was master of Olympic after Smith left. Um, he probably would have been in line for that kind of change within a very short order. Um, eventually, Charles Bartlett was given uh, command of Britannic but whether or not he would have been ready for that um, on Titanic that early is anyone's guess. So those we are all, two of my We thoughts. also know that Haddock had commanded Titanic on a trip from Belfast down to Southampton. So he's already had the experience of that ship. Yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't know is that Haddock actually was uh, Titanic's first master 
before she was actually signed over to the White Star Line. Uh, and E.J. Smith was on Olympic. He came back to Southampton on Olympic. He very quickly made a dash up to Belfast, and he was there just in time for what would have been the trials on April 1st, but which were postponed, of course, to April 2nd in the event. And he was just, just in the nick of time for the trials. And so Haddock had been the one who was in temporary command of the ship uh, while she was undergoing completion up at Belfast. And that's something that um, not always everybody, everybody knows. So definitely Haddock would have had the experience. Um, there's other commanders that would have been possibilities. Um, we know that Wild had received the command of his own. I believe that was the Simric Tad, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and, and that's one of the, the stories, like not to go on a segue off topic, but uh, Wild, um, when he was transferred to Titanic, it was uh, almost, it, not, it was an honor to be on any of the new vessels, obviously, but he was in line for his own command. So um, that wasn't likely to be a permanent assignment for him had he survived the, the maiden voyage in the round trip. Yeah. In fact, usually what happened is officers who were coming up the ranks and were being promoted to captain their first vessel, they might be on a crack liner as chief officer or as first officer, but usually what would happen, they would get their first command and they would be back on a smaller intermediate sized liner first thing. And then it would take time for them to work their way up. So one way or another, we probably don't feel that Wild would have been in line to command uh, Titanic, um, not in the near future anyways. And of course, our other panel members, Mark or others, can, can weigh in and, and give some input on that. But those are just some preliminary thoughts. Hopefully that answers that question for whoever it was that supplied it. Now there's another question that cropped up that I know that Tad, and I believe Mark Chernside, if he's still with us, um, I know that the two of you wanted to talk about this question. It was a really good one. What's the difference between a Titanic enthusiast and a Titanic historian? So you guys want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take the first part. Um, what's the difference between an enthusiast and a historian? And then I know Mark was going to delve into a little bit more of the difference between a researcher and historian. But what, what I view somebody, and I'll, I'll preface this in advance that there's no right or wrong here. Not everybody who's interested in a historic topic has to be a researcher, has to do original research on their own. It's quite all right and perfectly fine to be interested in something and and just uh, be enthusiastic about learning about it and um, enjoying reading books, watching movies, that sort of thing. There's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but I view an enthusiast as somebody, maybe someone who's a fan of the Cameron movie or one of the other um, films or documentaries and likes reading books about the subject and just finds it overall interesting. Uh, but they don't necessarily conduct original research or delve in beyond the surface. And maybe they're a collector that likes to own postcards and objects, but they don't really research the the history of the ship. And, and that's okay. That's a different category. And that's something where I think there's probably more people that are enthusiasts than researchers. And that's that's really um, just a different category. And um, a lot of researchers and historians have started out by being an enthusiast about Titanic or whatever your niche area of history that you want to learn about is. And then sometimes you find there's questions that aren't answered by existing um, books and documentaries, and you start delving into it and finding out things for your, yourself and, and asking those um, unanswered questions and trying to figure it out. So, um, as far as enthusiast versus researcher, there's not a right or wrong. It's what your personal level of interest is. But I know Mark has an interesting thought on the research aspect and responsibility that people have related to that. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, if you have a if you have a title Titanic historian, I mean, there's no job. There's no job spec. And um you know, it's it's not the kind of thing that someone does to earn a living. You know, it's it's not a nine to five or full time job. Um, you know, it's it's something that people do. You know, in a it, people do as an amateur, 
really. And I, I mean that in the old sense, you know, you amateur as in you're doing something as a labour of love, whereas uh, n- not in the modern sense that, you know, you're amateurish, you're, you're not really doing it properly. Um, and I, I think the, I think the whole point about, you know, finding new sources or, or, or information that, that's um, not been available before is key in terms of being a, a, a researcher. Um, but, you know, the, I think the huge problem with Titanic research is that there's been so much information, so many books, so many articles, so many programmes on the subject. Someone could write, uh, I'm not advocating this, but someone could write a book and not actually do any research. And it's been known to happen. They could simply take, you know, citations from all the different secondary sources that are already out there, put it together. That That's really not adding anything new um, to the subject. And I, I suppose in terms of researcher versus historian, I suppose I would say... Um, A historian has to be a researcher, but there's also the analytical side to it. And I guess there's a bit more emphasis in terms of analysis of that research, analysis of those sources. Um, And, you know, this is so this is so critical just to understand. uh, I mean, there are basic facts about Titanic that are simply not understood. Um, uh, and maybe, maybe if I give an example of that, that there's this long-standing myth, this long-standing belief that J.P. Morgan, um, either as the individual or in terms of the the, the bank with the with the name, uh, financed construction of Olympic Titanic um, and Britannic, of course, to follow. Um, you know, that's a widespread belief it's repeated in I don't know how many books documentaries probably the Wikipedia page if we if we checked it Um, and yet the reality is it's simply not true Um, but I can see why people might have thought that Um, there was a guy who worked for the White Star Line I think the name was Frank Bustard Um, and um, some of his recollections he shared with the Titanic Historical Society. I think this must have been the late 1970s, something around that 60s or 70s, that kind of time frame where his recollections were published. And one of the things he said, I believe, was something to the effect that without Morgan, without IMM, these ships wouldn't have come into being. So the kind of implication is that that's where the the financial resource came from to to build these ships. in reality, the source of finance is very clear. Um, if you read the annual report for IMM for 1908, um, J. Bruce Ismay, of course, was, was president and there was the IMM board of directors. They described in the annual report that the funds for this um, shipbuilding project were being raised by White Star, were being borrowed by White Star. Uh, We've got a copy of the prospectus that was issued in 1908 to uh, prospective investors. Um, You know, they they borrowed the money, so they issued bonds to people. And of course, they they had to pay interest on it. Um, These bonds show up on the White Star Line balance sheet. Um, So in terms of finance and how the the money was raised, it's actually very well documented. Um, but it, it's the opposite to what we see in so many um, secondary sources. Um, and actually, the, the question came up fairly recently on one of the Facebook discussion groups. Someone was asking about it. So, you know, I went through the detail, explained it. Um, I found out later they'd gone to another group and basically commented, oh, some guy's saying that, it, JP Morgan didn't finance construction of Olympic and Titanic. And I think there were about four or five people that jumped in and said, oh, I've looked at all my books. And you're right, JP Morgan did finance construction of Olympic and Titanic. So they've been provided with all the, all the information, you know, that they could look up, they could verify. Um, and you've simply got this, um, I, I, I guess this, 
this failure, people are sort of going with what they're familiar with or what's been repeated from book to book or, you know, or television programme to another. Um, so I think a huge part of it is that analytical side as well. You've got to research the subject. You've got to get as much um, as possible in terms of resources, but also just dig deeply in terms of doing that analysis. Um, but simply getting all that information together, it actually involves doing quite a bit of research. Um, and, it, you know, it's by it's by combining that, you know, finding those sources and taking the analytical side, um, you know, the historian really should uh, should operate. I think so often there are claims about Titanic that are simply wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm talking fact here. I'm not talking differences of opinion where, you know, we might have different views on something. Um, and yet the evidence we have is completely at odds with popular belief or what's been written in so many books. And it's by doing that analysis that you uh, get to the bottom of it. Um, so I guess that would be that would be my view. I've probably been rabbiting on for quite quite. No, a bit. no, Mark. I mean, it, what you're saying is is right on point. I would go a little bit further. I see a lot of people who have emotional attachments to things that they may have read or seen in a documentary or a program or from 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Big thing for me that I see a lot is the Titanic central propeller where there's this emotional attachment. <laughs> it had to have four blades because that's, you know, it was in all the movies, all the models have four blades on the center propeller. And yet that's a conclusion that's based on an assumption. The assumption is that Titanic's propeller was identical to Olympics. But the more research we do on propellers uh, on multiple ships of that era is that they change them as often as, or sometimes more often than we change a tire on a car. They were expendable components and they were constantly tinkering with them, trying to find the best balance of blade size, propeller size, you know, rotations on the turbine or the reciprocating. It was, it was constant of uh, the, the pitch of the, the blades, everything. Um, so when you're a historian, you have to be willing to let go of everything you've seen in the movie, uh, everything you've seen in multiple movies or shows or read in so many books that are basically just copying off of each other. And, and, and yeah. Yeah. As I say, um, Bill, Bill could probably go on a, a long discussion about this, but Bill, do you want to mention how many times books and articles have repeated the wrong number of survivors and victims. <laughs> a lot of books will say over 1,500 died. No, there's exactly 1,496 people perished on the Titanic. We have the names. And if you want to say over 1,500 people, well, who do you want to pick off those lists that, that died? It's wrong. We've, we, like I said, we've got the names. There is three separate researchers that I know of that came to the same numbers. Phil Gowan, Herman Soldner, and Lester, Lester Mitchum. They all work separately. They all came to the same points. If you look at their, their survivor lists or passenger lists, you'll see some very minor differences in the way names are spelled. But that's it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in you know, just because somebody writes a book does not make them a, a researcher or a historian. There's two books that I know of that came out in around the time of the 1997 movie. I bought both of them. They were complete crap. One of them, I actually started doing some research and I could find where they had come up with what they said somewhere on the internet. One of the books said that the Olympic was on site at the wreck site the morning of April 15th. Not true, but this book said it was. Um, they had a crew list that I looked at and I went, this looks like the crew list I supplied to Encyclopedia Titanica in 1999 or 2000. And my list had a few people on it that I had found references to, and my notes said, no, they really weren't on the Titanic. But this particular book 
had grabbed my list off from Encyclopedia Titanica, copied it without the notes. So I know where that one came from. But just because you write a book does not mean it's worthwhile. I think it's, that's that's one of the some big of are just things. junk. Yeah, one of the big things is um, editors at publishing companies really don't know the history behind Titanic. They may have seen the movie, they may know a little bit about the ship, but they don't know the history. So they read a well-written manuscript and they go, hey, we could sell this. And they're willing to put their name behind it, print it, and everyone makes some money off of it. Doesn't mean it's a good book. Same with uh, documentary producers. They don't know the history of the ships. They're depending on people that they go to who are recommended to them. And at that point, how good are the recommendations? Are they really being linked in with people who are historians? Or are they being linked in with people who pitch a fancy idea that the producers like because they know it will keep people past the next commercial break? So just okay. because your name is on the cover of a book doesn't mean you're a good Titanic researcher or historian. Just because you appear in a Titanic documentary doesn't mean your facts are straight. I believe it was last week there was a documentary that aired, very sad subject about the Titan tragedy. But I lost count of the historical errors that were perpetuated in that show regarding Titanic, that she was out to make the speed record, take the blue ribbon, that uh, 1,507 people died on the ship. Well, we know that's not an accurate number. And a number of other mistakes that were made as well. So don't believe it unless you read it in a, in a reliable book that's, that's done, you know, primary sources are referenced, critical thinking is done, and know your historians. Uh, you know, we revise our work. We try to make ourselves available to the public so that you can see that we're really trying to get things right. Um, and, and we're working hard to revise our own work to make sure it's in harmony with the latest thing. We're not stuck 20, 30 years in the past. Hopefully that helps to answer that question. You know, um, you know, Kent, it, it brings to mind a, a, an anecdote, and I, I won't, I won't mention any names. Um, but it concerns a documentary. I mean, this was probably 10, 15 years ago, and the producers were adamant that they needed someone that knew everything about the Titanic, um, and um, they approached someone who. Uh, I I know pretty well, um, and who I think is probably one of the very top leading um, people in the world in terms of their Titanic knowledge. Um, and this person said, well, I do know a lot about Titanic, but the, I don't know absolutely everything. These are my areas of strengths, and these are the areas I'm not as good at. Um, so they just outlined, you know, what they could offer for the for the program for the documentary um and they weren't taken up on the offer um and the response was oh it, it's okay we found we found someone who did know everything because they'd gone to some guy who said yes i know everything about titanic um and judging from their contributions <laughs> i don't think they did know everything about titanic um mm -hmm. It was probably their lack of knowledge that led them to think they knew everything. Um, you know, my my personal experience is the more I research this subject, the more you realise actually there is so much more to learn. So if someone's saying, oh, I know absolutely everything about Titanic or I'm an expert, then that's a huge red flag for me. But, yeah, this person, they were approached by this a production company yeah we need an expert we need someone who knows everything um that's what happened the and that's what producers want. They, they want you know the one talking head that can can fill the program and keeps everybody hooked unfortunately I guarantee you that dad kent and i don't know everything not a, that's collectively right. we know a lot everything no and, and, I, and I will say this is not not to belabor the point, and I won't mention names, but uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark alluded to uh, some well-known individuals that are very credible uh, for a number of reasons that have made some claims about the design of the ship and some other things that people um, on the Internet echo chamber, they see the name and 
in their background and assume that they're accurate, which I, I understand. But um, if you you can't really assume that because sometimes the claims that are made, even by people who have done other good work and um, do have some background history that's that's um, credible, it isn't something we can always assume is accurate just because of the name attached to it, yeah. even if it's recognizable. It's very true. Just because they're an expert in one area or have worked on one project or another that maybe we like, maybe, oh, oh yeah, that was a good program. That was very entertaining. Doesn't mean that their latest work is going to have all of the, uh, all of the research behind it. There's a reason that Mark um, in his presentation chose to talk about the strength of Olympic and Titanic's original design. It's because within the last year or so, there've been some claims from some pretty uh, well-known individuals that Olympic and Titanic is designed were weak ships and basically just accidents waiting to happen. It's perpetuating myths that go back 20 odd years. But when you look at the facts, they may be difficult to sort out. It may be dry to look at archival paperwork, but that's what you've got to do to find the actual truth of what was going on back then and, and the way these ships design, were designed and how they compared to other ships that were built at the time. So hopefully all that answers that question for our, our listener. We have another question here that I think I'll boil the question down um, and I'll give the backstory behind it. When we were doing the research for Honesty of Glass, one of the tidbits that we came across in a what we consider to be a good Titanic book, it was called Titanic Voices. It came out in the uh, early to mid 1990s, focused on a lot of oral history of the ship, what people said they saw, um, instead of being quite so much the authors themselves trying to, to summarize things. Um, one of the people that was referred to in that book gave a recollection that when Titanic had left Belfast to head down to Southampton, at the end of April 2nd, 1912, um, there was no clock in the famous honor and glory wall paneling and that a mirror had actually been substituted for the clock that was placed in that panel. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Ted and Bill, but I think in the many years since that book first came out, uh, I have not come across anything for or against the clock having been installed within that panel after that point, after the ship left Belfast. The Maybe. only reference we have is Titanic Voices. It said the clock was not installed, there was a mirror, and after that we have nothing. Yeah. No, it, one, um, no one on the ship took a picture, no one said one way or the other had it went that one, one statement in Titanic Voices is all we have. Possibly the clock was taken down to Southampton, installed there, but we don't know. It's guesswork. That, yeah, it's the only thing I'll, I'll add to that, and it isn't specific to the clock, is that um, our own research and then um, George Behe has continued, obviously, uh, anybody that's watching that isn't familiar with his work, I doubt there's very many here tonight from book club or elsewhere that aren't familiar with George, but uh, there's a, quite a bit of evidence of fixtures and minor things that were not complete in time for the maiden voyage, that there was still some installation work going on. So we, we certainly can't say definitively that the clock was not installed later, but it's one of those things where you start looking and there's no primary sources that confirm that it was either. <laughs> yeah. We have literally one statement by one person who saw it. And supposedly it was from Charles Wilson, who was supposedly the individual who carved the panel on Olympic and Titanic, which was called Honor and Glory. So you would think that if he really was the individual who did those carvings and he was so kind of intimately connected with that whole thing, he'd be a relatively reliable source. So when we found that reference, we included it in Honesty of Glass. We didn't alter it. We didn't add to it. We didn't say it definitely wasn't installed on the maiden voyage, we just took the statement that when the ship left Belfast, the clock apparently had not been installed and the mirror was in its place. Now, as we all know, there was a lot of work that was done to Titanic between the 4th and the morning of the 10th. Um, a lot of work, fixtures, furnishings, fittings. In fact, we have reports from people who were on the maiden voyage who said, for example, they were still working on the doors 
to the Cafe Parisien, uh, the things were still happening on the maiden voyage to finish the ship. It, it was it was very much a rushed thing because of the circumstances. Um, so we did a little research on the magnetic clocks for our 2019 book, Solving the Mysteries. What we found is that any clock on that circuit could be removed from the circuit and the rest of the circuit would still function. So whether or not the clock was installed or not installed, it wouldn't have any bearing on the operation of other magnetic clocks on that circuit. So that was one thing that we found. Personally, I would think that if the clock had not been installed up to the time of the maiden voyage, you might have gotten some people who recalled that it wasn't installed. However, you also have to recognize that two thirds of the people that were on Titanic went down to the ship. So, you know, is the person who would have mentioned it later on, were they someone who unfortunately perished in the disaster? Um, is it something that everyone kind of forgot to talk about? It's very difficult to say. So we can't really answer the question definitively. What we did is we put it out there and we're hoping that at some point down the road, maybe Mark in one of his trips to an archive or maybe someone else, they'll actually find a, you know, a handwritten summary of what was done to the ship in Southampton and, oh, yeah, the clock was installed. But uh, hopefully that helps to answer that question. We didn't make it definitive because we can't be definitive. And as far as odds of it being installed or not installed, flip a coin. But that's why it's so important, again, getting back to being historians rather than being emotionally attached to concepts. We all think of that clock, you know, on the grand staircase at 1140, you know, an SOS Titanic or meet me at the clock in James Cameron's Titanic. Everyone thinks the clock was there. The clock was there. We just don't know. So that's some one minor sense. point. Titanic voices actually came out in 1994. For the film, and I I actually indexed that book. There was so much great information in that book. I and a small team indexed it back at that point. So I've known that long. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Geez, that's thirty years ago. Wow. Yes, that's a little. It's amazing how the years pile up. Um, I'll also just throw this out there: no magnetic clock would have ticked like a uh, grandfather clock or like uh, another clock. They were electrically operated, and once every 60 seconds, they received an electrical impulse from the master clocks on the bridge that advanced their hands by one minute. So there was no second hand on a magnetic clock, and none of them would have ticked like a like you hear in some, some movies. So just an interesting tidbit to throw out there. Now, another question that comes up was, I think I can say beyond a reasonable doubt that those of us who've more obsessively researched the Titanic have our favorites when it comes to survivors and their stories. I'm curious what some of yours are, maybe some undersung perspectives you think deserve more attention. And of course, this is something any of our panel members can, uh, can jump in on, who your favorite individuals might be, favorite stories. Anybody want to take first crack at it? I guess I can, being I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> I first read Walter Lord's great book, A Night to Remember, when I was 12 years old, back in the early 60s. And I got hooked on the whole subject then. And at that point in time, that was the only book. There was also a two movies that I used to see fairly often on TV, um, the 1953 uh, Titanic movie with Clifton Webb and Barbara Stanwyck. And there was also the A Night to Remember movie. And that was all I had for decades up until the late 80s when I started finding other books. But that's how I got interested. <clears throat> then I, after a while, I joined the Titanic Historical Society. Uh, then I finally got online and I met George Behe and Tad Fitch. We started working together and it all built out of that. Really good point. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's This is a hard question because those of us that are um, people researchers, like you, I, you have to blend to have a good understanding of Titanic and the disaster. You have to blend a, at least a working understanding of the technical aspects of the ship and layout of the ship with the human element. Uh, 
and a lot of my research has focused more heavily on the human element, although I try very um, hard to understand and expand my knowledge of the technical side of it as well. Um, so it's really hard to narrow down which human story stands out the most. Um, one of the ones that really has intrigued, I think, not to speak for Bill and Kent, but um, is uh, the mess steward, uh, Cecil Fitzpatrick, uh, who was on the ship until the end. And he he's the, the witness that really cracked the story on Thomas Andrews and what really happened with Thomas Andrews, which wasn't staring catatonic in the smoking room as the, the story goes, but um, entering the water around the same time as Captain Smith. And we have a lot of evidence related to that that has come up even since on a sea of glass. But his story is fascinating, not just because of that piece of it, but here's a young man who was on the ship until the end and really was in denial, even when the well deck and the folk soul was going under it, the ship was was really going to sink. And then when he heard Andrews and Smith talking that it was going, uh, completely stunned him to the point of where collapsing against a bulkhead, as he described it. And then he ends up in the water struggling to survive and has this whole ordeal he went through. And it's just a very fascinating um, eyewitness account of all the things that happened late in the sinking. He really saw and experienced a lot of that. And it's a lesser known account um, aside from the Andrews aspect. What's interesting too, is there's, there's people who intrigue me because there's things that we don't know about their movements during the disaster. I think one of those is sixth officer Moody. Um, he, we know that he was on the scene of collapsible. A, we know he was, uh, he and Lowe had a conversation at 14 and 16. We found some other information. I won't give too much away about uh, a possible sighting of Moody at another lifeboat that really helped fill in the gap. But we don't really know a lot about how he, you know, he was of course on the bridge at the time of the collision. What did he do in those first minutes? How did he go from being there to being on the deck help? I mean, there's a lot about his, it's kind of an enigma. And it, for, for one of the senior officers of the ship, it's really remarkable what we don't know um, about his story. Um, and there's there's other examples of that too. Moody's a good one, but um, Chief Officer Wild really disappears from the eyewitness record after uh, being seen at Collapsible D with Second Officer Lightoller, um, there was a rush on that boat and he had his revolver out and uh, Colonel Gracie testified in the Senate inquiry that Lightoller told him he fired warning shots in the air. We have an account of Wild having his gun out at that boat as well. And then he's missing. And that when I say missing, it doesn't mean that there's any uh, greater story to that. We're not claiming that he's the officer, if anybody did that committed suicide or anything like that. But you look at the late part of the sinking, how few people are on the ship at the end and survive to give details. Um, he kind of disappears from the record after collapsible D. And it's one of those things where, okay, what happened to him? What, how did he um, end up perishing? And what were his last actions? We have one, one witness to even uh, confirm that Moody was at collapsible A and that's uh, Samuel Hemming, the lamp trimmer. And if um, he had died, then we would, he would, Moody would have disappeared after the aft starboard boats. Nobody would have known where he was. So it's, it, there's a lot of lost history that happened that just because nobody survived to tell about it. Yeah. It, it's an interesting thing. Uh, all of us, I think, have someone that we identify with or someone who intrigues us. Um, so hopefully that helps to answer that question um, from whoever it was who submitted it. Um, that was, that's from each of the authors of a Sea of Glass. Uh, hopefully that helps. Another question, what sparked your interest in Titanic? Um, I can speak for myself. When I was uh, three or four, my dad came home with a 1350 scale model of the Titanic. Um, we worked on that together, building that model together. Um, to me, at being that age, it was enormous. It was Titanic. Um, and so it, that and Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember, which was also my dad's because he was a big Titanic buff, um, 
I was a spontaneous reader at two and I read everything that I could get my hands on. And I still have his copy. In fact, I was reading it last night. It is the bindings have fallen off of it. The pages are torn and stained and dog eared. And that book um, was a starter for me as well as Raise the Titanic and SOS Titanic. Um, and of course the fabulous music that went into both of those movies uh, John Barry did the music for Race of Titanic and of course um, all the period music that went into SOS Titanic really helping set the stage. So that's kind of my story, the very short thumbnail of how I got into it. Maybe some of our other panelists would want to add their own uh, thumbnail sketch. But Well, I already mentioned mine being A Night to Remember and all I'm going to add to that is A Night to Remember is a great book. I've read it five or six times. I'll probably read it again at some point. But it has to be viewed in the fact that it was written in the 1950s. We know a lot more of what happened now than, than Walter Lord did back in those days. But that still doesn't mean it's not a great book and worth the read. Um, there's a reason I've read it five or six times. It's a fabulous book, but it is locked in time at 1958 research. So when you uh, when you're there, when you're there reading it, you have to keep that in mind. We also yep, know that's it. Yeah, that's it. There it is. We also know at least one individual um, who tricked Lord. Uh, he actually wasn't on the ship, claimed to have been a survivor, and um, his account, such as it was, made it into the book. Um, so there were imposters as well. And, and I would add, I mean, Night to Remember is the ultimate um, that started it all, the interest and in, in was really the first like serious holistic study of it. But um, there's mistakes in it. But um, Marcus's Maiden Voyage um, was an excellent read as well. And um, and I'll cite, I mean, obviously, Don Lynch and Ken Marshall for Illustrated History is still a classic. And there's things that they would they would certainly um, write and, and conclude differently now. But that's still that was one of the ones when I was young that um, I really read over and over again, but there's a lot of good works. <laughs> Definitely. A lot of good legwork that's been done by enthusiasts, researchers, and historians over the past hundred odd years you know, that we can all build on. I will also make one comment and that any George B. E. book is a great book and worth reading. Yes. George is one of the best. Yes. Anything okay. George puts out is worth having, <laughs> for sure. And I just read yesterday he has a new one coming out um, in the spring. It's only available uh, through the History Press right now. And you can't go wrong with a, with a Behe book, that's for sure. Nope. Patrick uh, Vita just mentioned in the chat, uh, he just got Those Brave Fellows. Uh, excellent book on Titanic's band. Um, George really cracked the old myth about the band being on the port side of the boat deck outside the entrance playing for however long in the freezing cold, you know, trying to, I'm sure Patrick can tell you your fingers will only work so well in freezing cold temperatures when you're playing a violin. Um, yep. That, that's, it's, <laughs> it's a very, um, I know when I play the piano and it, it's in cold temperatures, my fingers will start to freeze up. On top of the question, how do you get a piano out of the foyer? In a matter of minutes. Yeah, and get it out on the boat deck yep. around that 90 degree bend. It just doesn't make sense. But I mean, George just really cracked that open and he really was able to show just within the last couple of years that they stayed in the entrance until 2 a.m. or after. And then only then did they move out onto the starboard side boat deck, which is remarkable. So again, the, the emotional attachment to what you've seen or read or heard before, all of it has to go out the window in the light of cold, hard facts. Now, uh, we did have another question. Um, and I know that Tom Linsky has joined us. He is under the, uh, we were just talking about this before, the nom de plume or the nom something, uh, Captain T. And... I know that he's been busy this week. When we had to reschedule this event, unfortunately, it was very difficult to reschedule and it was not convenient for Tom because Tom is in the middle of moving. 
not just across the country, not just a distance of hundreds of miles, but to a second home out of the country. Um, so this is a very big weekend for them. He's literally loading up a U-Haul right now. But I asked him, you know, Tom, can you take a couple of minutes at some point to actually join our discussion to talk about what we had in store? And I know Tad Fitch is going to help us out a little bit because in addition to being a very stressful week, Tom is also sick. So his voice may not be what you guys are all accustomed to hearing in his uh, videos. But Tom, I see you unmuted yourself. So yes, sir. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you've got enough voice. We had a question that was specifically addressed to you. So let me uh, pose this question from our enthusiasts, our, our follower tonight, and see what we can do to answer it for them. The question was, could you adapt the Honesty of Glass animation into a small game? And that way we can have something to occupy ourselves until Lusitania the Greyhound's Wake releases. That's a good question. And um, it's certainly something that we've thought of. It could be kind of fun, although it might ruffle some feathers. Um, we are so busy right now, though. Uh, Lusitania is taking a lot of our time. Um, and we say that in the videos. In fact, we, we don't do as many updates as some people would like simply because we kind of want to stay under the radar for a little bit. We don't want to overhype only to have to take a little bit more time. I mean, for example, we hit a bit of a snag over the last few months having to redo a hull texture. The, the ship's hull is, is flat and the plating on it is a texture, basically a projected picture on it. And we've had to redo that from scratch after the artist didn't deliver. So that set us back a little bit the dog barking over there <laughs> and um, um so we've we've really just got our hands full with lusitania the greyhound's wake um the documentaries that you're seeing going up on my channel and we also have two very very large possibly three very large commission projects that are experiences um two of them make lusitania look like kids play you know it, it's it's small compared to those two others but those are for private clients however um you know this is slowly evolving into like the day job for a lot of our team as opposed to just a hobby so we have to work on that kind of stuff we have to take those jobs and we do enjoy doing them but that's my very long-winded way of saying i don't think we have the time or the resources to do something like that besides there's supposed to be something else doing that and I can second that motion, too, because one of the things uh, that's kind of slowed us down a little bit as we've come down the home stretch in the Greyhound's wake is we began to realize that um, a lot of what we were learning about the ship's history and the history of the sinking itself uh, through the research that was done by Mike, by Tad, by Levi, um, hundreds of pages of passenger accounts, recollections of what happened during the sinking. Um, what we were finding is that it basically rewrote the book on what happened during the Lusitania disaster. It rewrote the book on what happened in the months leading up to the Lusitania disaster. Some of the amazing things, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag on some of them, it would just be too early. But we began to realize with all of these, you know, there's, there's been other real-time animations on the Lusitania that have been done, and they've basically showed a more traditional and less well-researched version of what we were doing. And we realized we can't just throw this out there in a digital medium, whether it be an animation or whether it be a real-time experience, and expect it to garner uh, respect we realized we really had to go back and be historians again and be willing to put all of our findings in a book, not just a book that we just kind of write, you know, just will, willy nilly as the saying goes, but one that's ex meticulously detailed, end notes, original source material. Um, that way, when you watch the animations, when you watch the experience when you're, you're playing that experience later on you'll have the groundwork from the books and you'll know that what we show in those animations and those upcoming you know if we do documentaries or or whatever that it's not just us doing bad research and that's why we're different from any, anyone else it's because what we found was so truly different that 
we felt we had to show the maritime community the respect it deserved in showing our work and mm -hmm. letting you build trust and respect in that. And, and that's that's exactly right about uh, the sinking. There, without going into the specifics about it, there it's a lot different than what has been betrayed and what people expect from prior works. And uh, some of it's going to catch people off guard uh, without knowing about the accounts. And uh, that's not an exaggeration, hundreds of accounts and uh, large numbers of which are, are unpublished previously or haven't been published since the time of that disaster. So uh, it's going to, it's going to look and be different than what people have heard before. And we want people to understand that why, and that we're not, making wild assumptions it's all based on the forensic and eyewitness evidence yeah in fact there's a lusitania researcher that i know and have corresponded with for many years and you know when he asked me this question about you know well how are you thinking the final plunge took place you know what are you thinking about this and i told him well this is what we found he was shocked <laughs> You know, it was clear, even though we're messaging, you know, back and forth, his jaw could, you know, probably picking it up off the floor. And he literally didn't believe what I was telling him. And I'm like, yeah, um, you know, and experiences like that made me realize, you know, we, we really have to show our work. You know, that's what they always teach you to do in school. And I think every historian, uh, everyone involved in retelling the history of these ships, we, we really ought to be asked to show our work and show the legwork that we put into it so that you guys can have confidence in, in what we're saying. Unfortunately, when we decided to do the book, that began to bog down the release of the experience because first of all, as Tom mentioned, we had some individuals who left our team whose work wasn't completed or who needed to be redone, you know, basically from scratch. Um, we also had um, multiple configurations for Lusitania between 1907 and 1915 when she sank and we were in the first volume of the book, we were going to be showing every stage of the Lusitania's career in our renders that show up in the book, which meant that we had to have a very detailed analysis of what changed, you know, did a, did a boat winch change from this configuration to that configuration? Uh, when was the sunshade uh, on the ridge roof? When did that have five spars and when did it have six? Uh, when were the all of the supports uh, at the face of the bridge, you know, to, to prevent against uh, rogue waves? When were those installed? We had to do all of that research. And then our poor animator team, uh, Alex and Levi, I remember uh, we basically needed to give them oxygen because here we were, you know, they would come up with a render and I would go in and I'd say, oh, uh, this needs to be uh, tweaked a little this way. This needs to be tweaked a little that way. And, you know, they're rubbing their foreheads and they're going, you know, Kent. You know, it's a lot of work to do all of that. So what it did is it, it's going to make for a better experience uh, when it's done. But it means that we had to do it more slowly to give it the attention that it deserved. And hopefully uh, all of you who've been waiting, you know, for the experience and for the books to come out, hopefully you find that our, our work is justified and you uh, appreciate everything that we've done. I really hope so. I, I can tell you. Uh, some of the things that we've rewritten the book on, whether it's in volume one or volume two, you're going to be stunned when you, when you read them. So, so that helps to answer the question that Tom had, hopefully. But I know, Tom, uh, we were also talking a bit the other night. Being as it's mid-February and... All of us who are here tonight are usually uh, we're connected with Titanic in some way. Everyone kind of knows we have a tradition that we hold up every year. Uh, I know you've done it for years longer than we have. And I see that you're, um, your camera's off. So hopefully you're here to help talk about it and you can take a minute from your move. Um, but I know Tad and Bill wanted to talk about this a little bit too. Uh, as you all know, we have a real time uh, event that we do every 14th to 15th of April. We do this every single year. The live stream is um, always with historians, a panel like what we have tonight, um, where it isn't just the animation itself, but you can tune in on Tom's channel in real time. You can watch these events playing out in the animation and you can hear the historians uh, talking about these events. Um, we had the, the wonderful privilege the last couple of years of being joined by Ken Marshall, 
And I know this year we have some some plans for our live stream too that I think are really going to catch everybody off guard. I see you're back with us, Tom. So maybe you can um, maybe you can talk a little bit about our plans for the live stream and and uh, just kind of what everyone's appetite. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm sure most of you listening are familiar with our tradition. I've been doing a version of it. Uh, I, I think since 2013, maybe 2014, I've kind of lost track and I've uh, done it every year except 2018. Uh, Cause I was over in Ireland and I didn't have the proper connection to do it. Um, but I think this is possibly, it's either our 10th time doing it. Or it's been 10 years since the first one. I got to check the numbers again. But Kent, you started, you joined us in 2017. So um, you've been doing this quite a lot too. Um, and it's always a lot of fun doing this with you. But yeah, so if you're not familiar, what we do is in real time, as the sinking is unfolding, we, we calculate the difference in time zone so that we're sure that it's happening as it would have happened in Titanic's location at the ocean. Um and we just narrate the story as it unfolds. We have a historical discussion about it and um, share. We always try to share a different perspective every year, focus on different stories or um, different details of what was happening. And, and this year we have a, uh, a unique lineup of historians coming on. I don't want to say too much because, you know, things could always someone might always have to pull out for one reason or another. But as of now, I think people are going to be very excited. I'm very excited. And uh, yeah, so that's on my YouTube channel. And the, the the really cool thing is, you know, Titanic sank in two hours and 40 minutes. We start about a half hour, 45 minutes earlier to give an introduction and introduce ourselves before the event starts to unfold. But then afterwards, oftentimes we have a couple thousand people who are still listening for three or four hours after the sinking that's 6 a.m for us though so we're, we're dead the next day yeah. but it's a lot of fun to have so many people come together and and participate in this event and um i see someone in our chat here has requested if the chat could be muted but that's that's part of the community part of it i know a lot of people in the chat get carried away and some of them take it more lighthearted than others um but that is part of the community um for people to be involved, ask questions of the historians, share their feelings as it's unfolding. Uh, obviously, though, to sort of address any possible concerns you have, um, if people get unruly, we moderate it. Yeah. We always have moderators listening in and watching the chat and uh, addressing questions while at the same time removing people if they're acting too inappropriately. So... We won't be muting the chat, but absolutely we will be moderating it as we always do. Yeah, we. I know that some of my favorite moments in these live streams have actually been the yeah. result of spontaneous conversation on the panel when someone in the chat will pose a question. Um, and we've had some really incredible uh, discussions based on some of the input. But as, ta as Tom says, we we try very hard to make sure it's always a dignified and respectful event because even though we all love Titanic, in the end, it was an event that took 1,496 lives. And even for the 712 survivors, their lives were never quite the same again afterwards for any of them. So we're, we always have that in the back of our mind. Um, you know, it's not a money-making ploy. It's not, we're just literally commemorating an event and trying to share it with the world and, and trying to uh, help bring that history to a yeah. modern audience and help make it, make it relate, relatable. So we were Actually, not talking about who our panelists are this year. We aren't letting any of the cats out of the bag as far as that, because as Tom said, someone could get sick at the last minute. That happened a couple of years ago. Someone caught COVID and they had no voice. And if you have no voice, well, no one can hear you uh, when, we're, when we're doing the live stream. So it's, um, you know, we're just, we're, we're playing our cards close to the vest until we get a little bit closer, but we know it's going to be very exciting. Yeah. Um, now, Kent, uh, uh, are there any other questions for me? I, I hate to no, ask that, but I, I got to no, get back to loading up the trailer. Yes. Yes. So you go. Thank you for joining us, Tom. And, okay. um, you know, give our best to the family and we yep. hope you will be successful and you start feeling better. Thank you. For legal reasons, I have to emphasize it's only a seasonal home. It is not. Seasonal home. Well, seasonal. Uh, 
Yes, <laughs> or else yeah. it could That's cause why I made, sure, <laughs> made sure to mention that. What I'm mean. Pauline asked what the YouTube channel is on YouTube. It's Part Time Explorer. Uh, you just search that and you'll find the channel. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, it was it was great jumping in. I was I was listening for probably about twenty minutes before I started speaking. Um, but as always, it sounds like a great discussion you guys were having. I wish I could have sticked around a little longer. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Next, there's thanks, always next uh, time, Tom. And of course, yeah, that's right. 14th to 15th, we've all got that in our calendars. So, oh, do we ever? Yeah. All right. Um, actually, actually, one last note on um, the stream, if you have a minute. I think one of the one of the cool things is uh, most people on our panel are going to be tuning in from unique Titanic related locations. Possibly, it's not set in stone yet, but we have a lot of people tuning in from locations of significance and as things get more confirmed and we get a little closer we'll be addressing that more but i think it's going to add an air of authenticity to uh to the discussion yeah absolutely i was thinking the same thing tom so yeah. stay tuned could because, because we're going to be talking about it in the coming weeks you know yeah. as we firm plans up it's always a massive coordination i know tom and i i'm sure other panelists too we all get very nervous <laughs> going into it because there's so many technical hurdles and Titanic, if nothing else, teaches us that technology can fail. So we're always hoping that everything goes smoothly. Yep. And uh, hopefully it will again this year. And we hope you all yep. can join us as we uh, commemorate the anniversary of the sinking. So thanks for joining us tonight, Tom. All right. Ta-ta for now. Take care. TTFN. <laughs> you know that one. All right, cool. I do. Bye. I do. Take care. So uh, at this point, now that we've... Uh, concluded the main portion of our program. Let's swing back around to those of you who've stuck with us, who've listened to us rattle on about facts and figures and history. Do any of you who have joined us tonight, do you have questions that you want to ask any of our panel members? And again, um, if you want to raise your digital hand, usually you can find it under reactions. You can raise your digital hand and we'll ask you to unmute. And hopefully, even though we haven't had a chance to prepare for the real time, um, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that you guys fueled for us. So if you have a question, by all means, please raise your virtual hand and we'll see what we can do to help you out. All right, Rich Longino, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You have a question for us, sir? Yeah, you got it. Uh, thanks, Kent. And uh, I just, yeah, I wanna thank you and uh, Ted and Bill for putting on this, uh, the Zoom call, so it's been it's been great. Um, my question is uh, curious about the bulkheads, actually. So I know that in a lot of depictions, we always see like the watertight doors closing, like in the boiler room level. But also knowing that the bulkheads extended in some parts of the ship, I think uh, above where the boiler rooms and engine rooms were, maybe in passenger. Uh, corridors and that sort of thing. Were there doors there as well that automatically closed? Or um, I'm just, I was always curious about that because we always see like the boiler level, but nothing like above. Um, just so just wondering how that worked. Yeah, that's actually a really, really good question. Um, looks like Mark, Tr Mark Trinside um, is ready to go. He's turned his camera on and he's unmuted. So let me let him start to answer that. And then we'll, um, we'll just build on it as we go. Mark? Let's do that. Yes, it's a, it's a good question because, you know, this is a huge ship and you really needed watertight doors because without them, um, you just couldn't operate the ship. Um, so I'm going from memory here, so I might be slightly wrong. I think there were only 12, um, you know, we're talking about the, the tank top level, so right at the bottom of the ship. Um, which is basically the engine and boiler rooms um, amidships. Um, and of course, they could be activated uh, from the bridge. And of course, they had a backup um, mechanism, a float, so that um, even if the bridge didn't activate the watertight doors, then if water was flooding in, the doors would close anyway. Um, and that actually happened or seemed to happen uh, after the Olympic Hawk collision. Um, you know, Olympic had bad, bad damage. She had a, a large compartment flooded 
and um, you know the the float activated before the bridge had actually had chance to uh, to to activate the switch to to close the waterside doors. Um, but yeah, on the on the, the higher decks, um, it, there were waterside doors that essentially had to be closed manually. Mm. And um, I think there are, I'm sure there are passenger accounts and um, Kent, Bill, Tad, you're probably better up to speed than I am with, um, you know, witness accounts from the, the night of the disaster. Um, but I'm sure there are accounts where, you know, people said, oh, there was a steward or ship's crew were closing one of the doors on F deck or wherever it might have been. Um, and, you know, they they had time to do that. They had time to do that before the water, um, you know, reached that level. Um, and that, you know, that was something on, on other ships as well. Um, I mean, if you look at the numbers of watertight doors, so compared to Lusitania, for example, I think she had a, a, a lot more um, doors that were closed, um, you know, from the from the bridge. Um, believe that was partly a function of her also having longitudinal watertight bulkheads. So, um, you know, it, it, if you look at the numbers, you think, and Ken, you're probably more up to speed on Lusitania than I am, but it, in, at first glance, it looks like Lusitania had so many more doors compared to Titanic. Um, you know, that's largely because the the, the design was different. They had uh, longitudinal bulkheads as well as the transverse ones. And even then, some of the ones that you would think would be critical to having hydraulic or electric operation on Lusitania, for example, uh, some of the ones from the wing coal compartments into some of the boiler rooms, not even all of those were hydraulically operated on Lusitania. Um, so you kind of, like with Titanic, you have frequently in movies or documentaries programs, you have, you know, Fred Barrett's story is, is such a, uh, a massive thing that gets retold time and again, where they jump through the watertight door. So those doors, the hydraulically operated ones that were on the tank top get all the attention. But even as late in the disaster as um, when Jockin, uh, the chief baker was was below deck on E deck in his uh, stateroom. There was a watertight door right near his uh, stateroom, and he said that there were two people. The water was very close to where he was. There were two people that were trying to close that door manually with, I believe it was a spanner. He referred to and Tad and Bill. I'm sure can correct me if I'm remembering wrong. Yeah, and there and there's um what Mark and you have mentioned is is true. There there are accounts from passengers following the collision where they went out into the corridor and, and some of those doors that had to be closed manually were done. Literally there's a, a hole in the floor and they had to in insert the device through that and to lower the door um, that was below the deck where they were at. So uh, passengers obviously were very curious when they saw them doing that. And that's noted in a, a number of survivors accounts. What was it? Wheat, Stuart Wheat, who also uh, closed some of the doors in the vicinity of the Turkish baths and the first class swimming bath. If I'm remembering correctly, I think I saw Mark Don. Hopefully, I'm not misremembering names. And regarding the pronunciation of the Chief Baker's name, that's something that we've all had many uh, chuckles about because we've read it so many times. But when we go to talk to each other on a Zoom call or do a presentation, we want to say it correctly. We actually had to reach out to people with that last name in England and try to find out how they pronounce their name to give us an educated guess on how to pronounce his name in 1912. So that's why we chose that pronunciation when we speak. Um, I seem to recall that uh, Phil Gowan also pronounced it Jockin. Jockin, yeah. You, you look, at, we, we're, we're saying Jugin, Jogin, Jogan, yeah, just about every pronunciation in the book. But uh, that after we did some research, that's the one we settled on. So hopefully someone with the last name J-O-U-G-H-I-N doesn't come and tell us that we've been pronouncing it wrong for the last couple of years. So Rich, does that help answer your question? Yeah, that was that was great. And yeah, I think I because I might have been going through the inquiries and like, oh, they were watching folks manually closed door. I didn't know that was like a thing. And also like wondering like how the communication worked, like in terms of like the stewards or whoever it might have been. Yeah. You know, how that worked like from collision to like, oh, we have to close these manual doors now. Like that's just kind of an interesting 
thought, I guess. Yeah, it is. I, I think it was Wheat who he got, he didn't get any orders to close doors. I think he just kind of realized it would be a good idea if anybody hadn't done it already to go through and close those doors, mm-hmm. which begs the question, you know, how many of those manual doors were open and how many were closed? Because it was just a communication breakdown that night. Circumstance, it was nobody's fault. It was just things were happening relatively quickly and who knows what was done or not done. Um, yeah. 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 Thanks guys. That, that, that's what definitely answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Absolutely. Um, now we did have a question in the chat from JC. He said he would ask it live, but he's at work, so he can't. So hopefully um, he can hear us. She can hear us. Hi, JC. How are you? Um, you asked about uh, the stripes on officers' uniforms. That's a very good question. We know there was a reshuffling of Titanic senior officers in Southampton. Uh, we've actually been able to pin down Wild's official appointment to the Titanic to very, very late uh, before the actual sailing time. I believe, Tad, correct me if I'm wrong, or Bill, that we found when we were doing Recreating Titanic, he wrote the official notice had only come through the night before, if I'm remembering correctly. And I, I think he had gotten some clue that that was going to happen, but the official notice was was yeah. very, very late. <laughs> yeah. What's funny is uh, with, with Wild, Captain Smith obviously had a lot of clout within White Star. Um, for example, the selection of Chief Sur- Surgeon for Titanic, O'Loughlin, um, he was with uh, the Chief Surgeon uh, who later ended up on Olympic and O'Loughlin. They were out you know, eating lunch together in Southampton, and the story goes that O'Loughlin made the mistake of saying, you know, how tired he was of changing from one ship to another so late in his life. And Smith said to him, well, pack your things. You're coming with me on Titanic. And lo and behold, he ended up going on Titanic. We know that Wilde had been posted to command of the Simric, and yet that ship was held back uh, because of the coal strike. And yet Wilde did not leave with Olympic. When Olympic left Southampton on the 3rd, Wild was not on board. Why was that the case? And why did he stay off of Olympic on the third and official, you know, confirmation not show up until late on the ninth from White Star offices that Wild was to be chief officer on Titanic on the maiden voyage? That's, you know, five, six days of kind of confusion. It seems pretty likely to us that Captain Smith basically had pulled some strings, you know, and said, well, Wild, if you're not going to be on Simric, you might as well come with me on Titanic. And uh, it, they were just waiting for the company to kind of back that up formally. So because that confirmation came so late, clearly Wild was going to retain his three stripes on his sleeve uh, as chief officer, going from chief to chief, he was going to stay the same. We know that Blair had been set, uh, second officer of Titanic originally, and he was left on the beach, as the saying goes. I think Light Toller put it that way. Um, but that required Light Toller and Murdoch each to step back in rank. Yep. Well, um, you're not going to change the stripes on your sleeve uh, in the last couple of hours leading up to departure, and you're not going to change it before you have official confirmation that you need to change it. So that's where the kind of finding out how late that confirmation came into play is kind of important. We have a photograph uh, taken in uh, Queenstown Cove, as it's called now, of Murdoch and Lightoller standing at the gangway. um, And you can actually see the sleeve stripes and they're wrong for for Lightoller's um, actual rank. Uh, He was wearing the stripes of first officer still on his sleeve. Yeah, and that... And, and Kent, that's something that um, Bill, Bill Wormstead and I, when we were working um, on Bill's website a number, I mean, way, way longer ago than I want to admit, uh, we were working on an article about the claims of passengers being shot and an officer potentially committing suicide. And Bill and I, when we originally worked on that article, that, that picture that you're referencing, uh, we had never seen anybody... Um, point out that Lightoller has his first officer stripes uh, still. Um, and now it's kind of something that people cite pretty regularly. Um, I can't 100% say for sure that nobody ever noticed it and just didn't publish, but uh, we had never seen that in print before. And, and it's it's really telling because uh, it does go to show that that um, 
shuffle of officers wasn't something that was planned out really well in advance. Um, it was quite likely temporary and it was done in a way that they didn't have time or think it was justified to alter their uniform to reflect that. And that, that has some implications of uh, individuals that were on the ship that hadn't served with these officers before. Uh, you have people mixing up the ranks of chief officer and first officer with Murdoch and other individuals. And that, that really kind of could partially explain that they didn't know them by sight, uh, but they did know the uniforms from serving on other ships. Yeah. Hmm. If they weren't familiar with the man and his name by sight, then it would have been very easy for them to have made mistakes. And time and again, in the historical record, as Tad says, that's what we find. You know, they would say chief officer when they meant Murdoch, or they would, you know, it, it's, it gets very, uh, very confusing sometimes to sort through the eyewitness testimony. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was recently came up on social media. I was aware of at least some of those posts, but we know that Lightoller didn't change his. So probably... 80, 90% shot that Murdoch hadn't changed his. And, um, you know, that probably led to a lot of the confusion. Does that help answer your question, JC? Awesome. Great. We, we do well, know that there were quite a lot of misidentifications of the chief officer the night of the sinking. People would say the chief officer, and we could be sh pretty sure that they were talking about um, Murdoch. Murdoch, not wild. Yeah. Um, we, I strongly suspect that Lightoller did not change his stripes either. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. Okay, so now we have uh, George Sophocles. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, sir. Sophocles. Um, it sounds like a, a Greek name. I, I really hope I'm saying that right. Oh yes, that's uh, fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm from uh, from Cyprus originally, but now I live in London. Wonderful! Uh, so Thank you for joining us. Just midnight here. Thank you very much for the event, for the fantastic a sea of glass book. So I have a quick question regarding the restaurant staff. I think there is some testimony from one of the survivors, uh, Paul Mojé, if I'm um, remembering the name correctly. Do we know from any other evidence uh, whether they were held back and prevented from reaching the boat deck until very late. Do we even have any evidence if they even made it at all onto the boat deck until the very final stages of the of the sinking? Or could they have been even trapped into the ship in the ship? Very good question. Thank you, sir. Um, Go ahead Dad and talk. Will... Ken, I'm going to look something up real quick. OK, Dad, I you, may have a feel. you want to take first crack at this question? Yeah, and his his account of that was that they were held back. Um, as you're aware, um, I'm not I'm not aware of any accounts that support that from other sources at this point. I, I have a strong feeling I know what Bill's looking up, um, <laughs> which may may bear out some of that uh, from statistics about um, victims and who was recovered and all that. But um, I, I've not run across other accounts that. 100% state, yes, there was, they were held back, but um, it seems to me that would be a strange uh, claim for him to make as a, as a person who was serving in the capacity that he was. Um, you're not talking about a passenger that was uh, filing for liability or that was being interviewed in a, the yellow press where they made things up or anything of that sort. Uh, I find his accounts pretty credible, but there's a difference between saying that and then also having additional eyewitnesses that back it up. Yeah. Um, I, did a, I did a study quite a, quite a few years ago about the body recovery. And I broke it down by the class of crew, passengers, whatever. And approximately 23% of the people who died, uh, their bodies were recovered. So that's that's kind of the average right there, 23%. Um, when we look at um, the engineers, well, not even the engineers, uh, the, the, the postal, um, the, the, the average is really low. But when I look at the a la carte restaurant, they have a re um, recovery rate of 17%, which isn't that much lower 
than than the average of 23%. And if they were kept locked inside the ship, I don't think it would be that high. So it looks at least like some of them made it up top before the end. Yeah. I think that's that's a really excellent point that Bill makes there is that sometimes you'll get a report of somebody being held back and somebody else who survived will see that person held back and then they move on, they survive, and then they say so-and-so was held back at that point. Well, that may be perfectly true, but the real question is what happened after they left the scene? Just because someone was held back at a specific point in time in a specific location of the ship does not mean that they were not later able to get up on deck by other means. It just means that they didn't survive the disaster as a whole. And if nobody knew them and recognized them who also survived, then that last sighting of them being held back, it it kind of, you know, makes us kind of break out in a cold sweat, the idea of people being held back. Um, and yet, as Bill says, the body recovery rate is not that much lower than for the other than, than for the others as a whole. And, and I, that- I've I've read many times that the all the postal people were trapped below deck and they all died there. Yeah. However, their recovery rate is forty percent. Two out of five bodies were recovered. Well, that tells me they weren't trapped below deck. Yeah. And, and quite honestly, I. Uh, I, obviously, there was a, a lower recovery rate for some some groups than others, uh, and Bill's analysis of that is really helpful. But I, I don't suspect that there was a very large number of people that physically went down inside the ship uh, compared to the overall number that died. I think most of them, at some point prior to the sinking, found their way up on deck or were able to get access. But the problem was it was well after most of the lifeboats were gone. Um, so obviously they had a much lower chance of survival, even, even if they did get access to the top. Yeah. And that that holds true even for the majority of third class passengers, um, because what many people don't know is that third class passengers, they would had four or five days to find their way around the ship. They all knew that you access your dining saloon off of Scotland Road on EDEC. Well, what's at both the forward and aft ends of EDEC? You have a path to the general rooms, forward and aft, and you have a path to the smoking room at the stern. And once you're at the general room or the smoking room at the stern, that's the aft well deck. You have access to your own section of deck. Nobody's going to stop you from from getting out to the well deck or to the aft poop deck. Um, So all of these kind of scenes of people, you know, being held back in locked gates. You do have some reports, but it doesn't mean that they stayed there and that's where they died. We, we tend to think that most of these people uh, ended up making it up onto the decks other than those who chose to go back down. We do have some of those reports as well, unfortunately. But um, does, does that help answer your question, sir? Yeah, oh, you, two, th- two thumbs up. I can ask you to unmute so you can, uh, <laughs> there we go. Right, thank you very much, yes. Sir. Answer my question. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Now we have another question from someone who follows our work avidly. He was with us last year when we did our our live event, Nathan Hudson Young. It's very good to see you again. Thank you for joining us, sir. What's your question? Let me ask you to unmute so you can ask it for us. Uh, My question, it's kind of weird, but what was the plan for if someone in a lifeboat waiting to be rescued had to go to the bathroom? Like, they were quickly evacuated off of the ship, so they didn't have a chance to go, and they don't know when the Carpathia is going to arrive, so what was the plan for if they had to go to the bathroom? (laughs) I don't think there was a plan. All I can say is, if I was in the lifeboat and I had no idea when the rescue ship was coming and I needed to go, I would. There's no yeah, there, there was there was no I guess per- I could stand up in the lifeboat and go over the side, but then everybody in the lifeboat sees me. Yeah. There was no what? provisions that I'm aware of for that no. at all. So I agree that no plan. <laughs> you know what's funny about that, Nathan, is I've I've wondered that myself. There was an account, I can't remember the person who said they took a big drink of water before they left their stateroom. And 
you know, I, you know, movies have been done where people are dying of thirst and the lifeboats adrift for days on end. And I think, oh, that was smart. And then it's occurred to me and I'm like, wait a minute, um, how big a glass of water? <laughs> and I think anyone who maybe watched Ghost of the Abyss and the whole conversation about um, when you're diving to the wreck, you know, bathroom facilities and whatnot that may that may come up. An interesting question, but I, I don't know. I'm well, not aware of anything. We know that Baker Jockin was drinking alcohol before he got off the ship. And he ended up in the water holding on to collapse uh, Isaac Maynard, if I remember correctly. But he was actually half in the water. Well, what did he do with all that alcohol? I know what I'd have to do, but nobody would know because that part of his body was underwater. Yeah. What's interesting is that Titanic's era was in many ways more refined and more civilized than what we're accustomed to today. I mean, people dressed to the nines, they, you know, comported themselves in a very dignified way. But there were also some areas where 1912 was 180 degrees out from what's acceptable today. Not everyone, for example, showered every day or took a bath every day. I believe uh, even as late as the 20s and 30s, there were jokes going around, I think, with the Three Stooges where, you know, you take a bath once a week. Um, so, I mean, you know, body odors, uh, how did you care for those things? I mean, it, it, in many respects, it was just a very different mindset than, than what you have today. And I think that's where there's a lot of misunderstanding about only two baths being supplied to Titanic for third-class passengers. It's like, oh my goodness, they didn't care about the third-class passengers. Well, they were only supposed to be on the ship for less than a week. And if you're only used to taking a bath once a week, taking a shower once a week, um, that's not going to pose that much of a problem. Uh, even many of the first class passengers did not have private toilets and private uh, showers and baths. That's uh, a, a big thing. Titanic was not uh, the ship of dreams when it came to toilet related matters and, and, and personal hygiene. It was, uh, you know, very much a holdover from, you know, previous times. I hope that helps. We also need to keep in mind that um, even in the 20s and 30s, a lot of houses did not have indoor plumbing. I remember when I was a little boy at one of my aunt's houses, and she had a lot of people over, and I had to go. And I told my aunt, I, I, said, I have to go, but somebody's in the bathroom. She said, well, you see that little building out, out in the back? Go in that. Yep. And that was my first experience with an outhouse. But nowadays I realize it was because my aunt's house, when it was built, didn't have indoor plumbing. My, my mom's house when she was growing up didn't have indoor plumbing. It did years later, but, and that's in the twenties and thirties. Um, people weren't used to having indoor plumbing is my point. Yeah. I have especially third one thought class. On, on this. Uh, ahead, if you don't mind. Uh, speaking from experience, I've I've been a Civil War reenactor for ten years, and so I spent a good deal of my time in period wool uniforms, period drawers. And when it gets cold, and we're talking as cold the night they get the ship went down, if you're out in the field for a period, a certain period of time, and you're going into a fight, and the adrenaline's pumping like a lot of these people probably were that night. Going to the bathroom becomes the last thing on your mind. And then I think you couple that with the fact that Carpathia actually showed up in a rapid period of time. We're talking, what, an hour and a half, two hours after the ship foundered? Yes. You probably didn't have enough time to even think about wanting to go to the bathroom before they were already on the ship. So I can imagine the line for the John on Carpathia was probably pretty long. Yeah. <laughs> we do know, of course, uh, I believe it was um, Lucy Duff Gordon, I believe, who was seasick in the lifeboat. Uh, would have been a very embarrassing uh, thing to for any man or woman from that era to be physically ill at that point. Um, and that's another to... thing. Yeah, it, it, the, the entire process of going to the bathroom in 1912, if you're in a lifeboat full of first-class ladies, don't even think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it just wouldn't happen. And, and there's a number of accounts of people that were seasick, and that's, yeah, it was downplayed because of that reason, the yeah. humbleness and, and obviously embarrassment and that. 
would have been very embarrassing. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, when you got to go, you got to go. Question. <laughs> what, what was that, Bill? But when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> yeah, you got to go. So thank you uh, for posing that question, Nathan. And thanks for joining us again. We, we really enjoy, especially our young enthusiasts that are up and coming and that they follow our work. We, we appreciate having your support. And, you know, hopefully uh, we always keep it interesting for you. So do we have, we, looks like we've got another question coming in from Bridget. So let me uh, unmute you here. What's your question? Hey guys, um, I just had a question. I loved reading about uh, the captain of the Carpathia and all the measures he took to just kind of prepare the ship and his crew for taking on, bar, uh, on board so many people and not, well, really not even knowing what he was going to find, you know, uh, what kind of books did you, have you read or, or articles you've read about him or the rest of the crew and their stories about that rescue and the efforts that they went in? Very good question. Thank you for the, asking. The best answer, in my opinion, is the, the British and the American inquiries. Captain Rostron gave a long account in great detail of what he was doing and thinking as they were rushing to the wreck site. Um, and both the American and the British inquiries are online. Yes, and they can be read for free in their entirety. And he had long stretches of testimony on you know, a variety of different subjects. So uh, as, as, as Bill says, definitely that's, that's a good starting point. Uh, also, I would highly recommend George Behe. We, here's that name again. George is, um, George is one of the best Titanic historians out there. He wrote a book um, on board Carpathia. Um, there may be some information in there on that. I think there was also a couple of Carpathia's senior officers who later became captains in their own right. Um, Boxall. Yeah, I'm not Boxall. Um, James Bissett. Bissett, yes. Thank yes, you. Bissett, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and they and wrote, they're... you know, their own memoirs that contained experiences from that night, some of which you could tell their memory had faded a bit, but they had some interesting insights um, into events that night and how they were introduced to it. So kind of all of those things together, that's how we do our research. We, we pull as many disparate lines into one and then we kind of throw it into the mix and see what comes out. So yeah. and George had two books. One of them was called On Board RMS Titanic, which is very many first person of accounts of people on the ship. And then the second book I think was called The Titanic and the Californian, um, which is the point of view of people on the Carpathia of what they saw and they heard. Um, both books excellent. Yeah. yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And the Carpathia book in particular has the perspectives of passengers and crew members of the, that were aboard during the rescue. And some of them, like the Hungarian doctor Arpad Langil, who I might be butchering that pronunciation, but he wrote some very detailed accounts of the rescue and what what um, how they treated the passengers and some of the injuries and, and things of that sort. And George, of course, included some of those in that that book. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> And Rostron mm -hmm. himself has his own memoir as well, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Was that Home from the Sea? Was that the name, that of the name of it? I think. I think. Don't quote us though. <laughs> yeah, Rostron did leave a book. Yes. He he had some interesting ideas about Gallipoli. Uh, read into that what you will. And uh, the other thing you have to understand is that sometimes recollections would change over time. So what Rostron testified to in 1912 with the American or British inquiries, you know, when you go back and read, an, uh, read a later account by him, you might find variations where it, it could be additions. It could be that he remembered, you know, a uh, different order of operation when he'd had time to sort through things. Um, but sometimes the story will evolve too. So it, it's interesting to compare a 1912 account with one from the 20s or 30s and see where the differences are. And so what Ken just said about Rostron also holds true for Lightoller. Yep. He and gave, everyone else. Yeah, he, he gave accounts in both the American and the British Inquiry that don't quite agree with the book he wrote in 1935, I think it was. Yeah, although what's funny is when you know his earlier testimony and his earlier recollections, and then you read the 35 book, 
you can kind of see where he'll walk up to a line where his rec recollection is going to get inconvenient and then he changes gears. So it's, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, interesting. So Bridget, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hopefully that helped to answer your question. It did. Thank you. I did read the inquiries before, but I'm always looking for other books to read, but yeah, I definitely take them with a grain of salt, especially if they're older books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that we, we, we tend to do is we tend to put a lot of credence in recollections. An individual can be wrong and very often they were, but when you compare recollections from five, 10, 50 different eyewitnesses to any event, a pattern begins to emerge that if you ignore it, you do so at your own peril. Um, and so that's why it's, it's neat to compare different sources. Our next question looks to be coming in from Bruce Williams. What question do you have, sir? Okay, I can see you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Can anyone else hear Bruce? No. Sorry, I was on mute on my laptop, it seems. There we go. Now we can hear you. Welcome. What's your question? Um, I was wondering if uh, when the Olympic was going through all those refits after the Titanic sank, how did they know that in any of the extra weight they were adding on, like the double hull and the, all the lifeboats and the bulkheads, how did they know it wouldn't cause the ship to capsize or um, anything catastrophic to happen? Very good question. I have tagged Mark to see if he will have some input on that because Mark is my first stop for questions like this. Do you have any input on that, Mark? Okay. Um, well, just as, I guess, just as a bit of context. Um, so over, over the course of her career, um, in 1911, um, Olympic had a, uh, a dead weight um, capacity of, I think it was 14,030 tons or something like that. And by 1935, so that's after she's had both the post Titanic refit and then the, uh, the refit after the um, end of the war. Um, if I remember rightly, that was down to about 11,500. Um, and the significance of that is basically that the the ship's the ship's displacement, so the ship's overall weight, um, it, it stayed the same. So it's fifty two thousand three hundred and ten uh, tons. Um, but what the uh, what the reduction in the dead weight tells us is basically that's an increase in the weight of the ship it, the ship itself. So without cargo and so on. Um, so you're talking about the addition of about two and a half thousand tons overall of, of, of extra material of, of, of steel and so forth. Um, so it, it is it is significant, uh, uh, you know, uh, by, by itself. Um, and uh, I, I guess in in that context, it does it does make a difference. Um but you know, Hand and Wolf, they they did quite a bit of um, you know calculation in terms of um, things like the ship's um, GM or the ship's metacentric height, um, and you know we've got data for I think it was 1925 for Olympic. Um, it's all within a reasonable kind of um, kind of tolerance. So um, I've no doubt. It was something that they looked at. I don't think we've got any specific um, calculations as to kind of before and after. Um, but yeah, there were no there were no reported um, issues. So um, you know, they the modifications that they worked through, they uh, they did them well. Yeah, and of course, Britannic was slightly wider than Olympic and Titanic had been. Yeah. So yeah. those modifications there that would have uh, helped in, in her stability, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah. Absolutely. I think I think it would be fair to say that a lot of people today don't give enough credit to the people at Harlan and Wolf and what they knew about ships. 
Um, you know, for example, like Edward Wilding, you know, it said that he knew the cubic capacity of every compartment on Titanic. Now, whether that's something that he had to look up or whether he knew it kind of off the top of his head from doing that research, these guys, they didn't have computers. Um, they were working very much from many years of experience um, and they just knew the ships. So, I mean, if you've rebuilt a car, an engine, you know, something, you know how it works, you know what you've done to it, you kind of know how you can modify things uh, you kind of get an instinct or a skill over time uh, from, from being so intimately kind of connected with those ships and how they were made originally. You know kind of what you can do. Um, of course, it didn't always pan out. Harlan and Wolf was a very good shipbuilder. Some other shipbuilders, they didn't know exactly as well. Um, there were instances of uh, ships capsizing on launch, uh, things like that. But Harlan and Wolf, by and large, had this really solid reputation. Um, their, their guys really knew what they were doing. So does that help answer your question, Bruce? Yeah, thank you, guys. You're welcome. Welcome. Thank you for asking. We have Nicholas. I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you so much for having us. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, I have a question since I'm more like Lusitania guy and not so familiar with Satanic. I mean, I was as a kid, but I have always wondered why, um, despite iceberg warnings, Captain Smith didn't reduce the speed significantly when he was going through the ice field. And then, I mean, I follow discussions of you guys on, on Facebook. Of course, I'm like a passive reader. And somebody said, yeah, it wasn't customary back then to reduce the speed. They would just do it. But if you ever gone through your house, in, in darkness, because you can't find the light switch. I mean, there would have been, I mean, there was to be expected that something could have gone wrong. So why didn't they reduce the speed? That's yeah. my question. That's a, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah. What's and, funny about and, that is that it wasn't just before Titanic sank. We know, I think it was Lusitania, but it could have been Mauritania. I'll have to look that up later on. Uh, one of those two ships, which were faster ships than Titanic was, Right after the Titanic disaster, they went through the same ice field at night at top speed. And they said, no, we didn't slow down. Um, so in the British Inquiry, they um, interrogated quite a, quite a few cap captains of other ships. And they all said, no, we don't slow down in ice. We, we, we look for it, but no, we don't slow down. And, so and the, what Captain the, Smith was doing was what everybody else was doing. He wasn't that, any that's exactly right, Bill. And I mean, it's, it was standard operating procedure. And the, the exception would have been if there was fog or a loss of visibility, um, that that would have been the situation where some captains would have slowed down. But in clear conditions, you're right, that that's was the status quo about how, how they operated back then. And it seems counterintuitive and, and even um, foolhardy in a lot of ways by with hindsight, but that that wasn't how they were viewing it then. Yeah. And there's been a lot kind of, of the same. Well, go ahead, Bill. Uh, kind of the same philosophy as the lifeboat. Um, they had rules that said how many lifeboats they had to, to have, but the rules didn't say life ropes for everyone. The Titanic had more lifeboat, more lifeboat space than it was required to have, but they did not have lifeboat space for all. That changed very quickly after the Titanic sank. But those are the rules. And yeah. Captain Smith going into the ice field full speed, that was normal. Yeah. Not saying it's right, but that's what they did. And regulations and changes to standard operating procedures are frequently, so frequently in, in human history. We see it time and again in the last century, the last thousand years, you know, more. They're written in blood somebody does something it's it becomes a practice it becomes accepted it doesn't mean it's smart it just means that everyone's getting away with it and they think it's okay and they think it's safe and then something bad happens and that's when the regulations change it's just it wasn't unusual for captain smith to have done that in fact they knew exactly what time to expect it they 
they'd had conversations among the bridge officers. Uh, Smith had talked to Lightoller. Uh, some of the senior officers had talked amongst themselves. Um, and they knew he, we're going to be in the ice at about this time. What are the conditions? All right. We know if X, Y, and Z happens, we'll have to slow down. But standard operating procedure, full speed ahead. And we, we trust our lookouts. Um, and that did not change. That's, that, it didn't even change with the Titanic disaster, unfortunately, because we have those records of other ships like Lusitania or Mauritania pushing right through. Top speed, 25 plus not faster than Titanic could ever go. So um, I, I hope that it helps answer your question. Kent, do you mind if I throw up a map really quick? I found in the National Archives this week showing the ice field that Titanic was heading into and kind of give you an idea of what was ahead of them. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I know that the map is a little bit inaccurate, but it will give some idea for, for um, people who are, um, I know which map you're referring to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it yeah, it may not be the most accurate thing, but it's but it does one. give a good idea of what they were up against. Um let's see, where is that? There we go. And while he's pulling that up, I will say that you know, a lot of people will say, Well, Captain Lord stopped the Californian. Um that was unusual. That was very unusual. Um, it was smart, but it was not the standard practice. And Lord yeah. didn't want to damage a ship, he couldn't tell exactly um he couldn't pick his way through a thick ice field. Titanic had not encountered thick oh, come on. ice. Not at that Okay. Point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking. It's a good question. I think it's misunderstood a lot. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I, I thought I downloaded the high resolution one. Apparently I didn't. Yeah. Okay. I know you got it, Josh. I got this. You. I'll... Okay, I don't know what my computer's doing. I have confidence. One second. <laughs> while while he's doing that, it's like uh, one of the things that's interesting to to consider is how close together um, the loss of Titanic was and the change in regulations regarding lifeboats and ships being uh, retrofitted to hold more lifeboats. They're uh, throwing collapsible lifeboats on rafts, all that sort of thing, and the outbreak of World War One. Um, not very long after the sinking, really, if you look at it from a, a timeline perspective and uh, those regulations and, and changes and lifeboats being more readily available in larger capacities, there were so many ships sunk during the war, uh, particularly by U-boats, that you can really talk about how that impacted um, lives that were saved at the outbreak of the war, um, an early part of the war, because they did have... Uh, capacity for more boats at that point yeah who knows okay i got her now there we go josh thank you i mean this is a remarkable um it was basically a wall of ice that was coming down and you know i think it was sam in one of his books ran some numbers on you know, how likely was it that she hit the first iceberg that she saw? And the odds were statistically low. And I know George has done some research uh, where he's turned up accounts where there were possibly reports of other icebergs sighted, you know, in the few minutes before impact. But it wasn't at that point impassable, like what California encountered a few miles to the north. It, it was still open water. Um, and in open water and good weather, you just, that was their thing. They just go full speed. Thank you, Josh. Sure. Appreciate that. Does anyone else have any more questions for us? Anything you want to ask us before we wrap up the event for the evening? Ah, Bruce, go right ahead, sir. Um, I read somewhere that the Titanic's launch was filmed and it was lost to history. Um, what are the chances of them finding that? Good question. Um, I have heard those reports as well. Um, we know Olympic and Britannic's launches were both recorded. Uh, and we have that footage available today. Um, what I think 
surprises me most is back in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of statements made like Titanic's original blueprints were destroyed in World War II or in a bombing or, you know, um, and then later on they found them. Okay. Um, I think there's more Titanic material out there to find. New images have turned up in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, they may be sitting in an attic somewhere that no one knows what they have. And, you know, in an estate sale, maybe some auctioneer is called in that kind of knows a thing or two. And they say, hey, wait a minute, you know, that's, that, that's not Olympic or Britannic. That's actually Titanic. It would be nice to see. The only discouraging thing for me is that with all of the interest in Titanic, it hasn't turned up so far. So... Yeah, we, we'll we know see. we know for sure it existed at one point, and there's ample documentation to prove that it was around after the sinking, but um, who knows if it's still around, and if it is, if it would even be viewable condition, depending on how it was stored. <laughs> yeah, good one. Very good point, Ted. Does that uh, answer your question, Bruce? Okay, hopefully it did. Hopefully you did. Okay, so we have a question from Colin. What's your question? All right, is the, is the mic working? Hello, I think so. Hello. All right, I uh, came in a bit later, so hopefully this isn't like a repeat, but since it was just brought up a second ago, um, I remember I think on the On a Sea of Glass live stream last year, uh, there was a mention of some account or other of that would allude to Titanic having avoided ice beforehand a little bit like maybe not necessarily in a you know really dramatic way but just you know just reports of seeing it off to the side so i was just kind of wondering uh if there's any more on that like if they really did end up hitting pretty much the first one they saw or if there were plenty of accounts of seeing it like oh there it is off to, if you look to your right there's a bird you know just like the day before or something like that um, George B. He wrote a book just in the last year. Uh, geez, maybe Ted and Ken can help me with the name of it. Something of, there's talk of an iceberg that gets into all the people who claimed to see another iceberg both before they hit the Titanic and even afterwards. Mm. Uh, and George is very exhaustive on, on his research. Uh, that would be a good, great place to look for the answer to that. All right. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ted. You were going to say something? No, I, I was just going to reference the same book that Bill mentioned. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, um, George has put enough evidence out there so that only a fool would go to the point of saying, <laughs> no, 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 that it, it was definitely the first iceberg they saw. I, and to be so conclusive about that. Mm. Um, I think there's still room for doubt, room for question. But George, George is so exhaustive. He raises some good points, um, you know, with those accounts, and they have to be weighed into the mix. Um, one of the things that I think of is, you know, wouldn't they have heard the lookout bell ring before? Wouldn't somebody have reported that, a passenger or something? Well, then I stop and think, and I say, well, you know, how many passengers reported hearing the lookout bell for the actual iceberg to sank the ship? So <laughs> you, it's very difficult to be definitive about certain things, but George's work has raised some good questions, things we have to pay attention to. Yeah, a bit of an Occam's razor type thing. Is that, if it's the simplest explanation, it's probably it. Yeah, and I think the other thing is we've learned not to question eyewitness statements because when you have three, four, five, ten 10 people saying the same thing, if you're gonna go against that, you weren't there. Uh, so not a wise thing to do. So it's worth paying attention to for sure. Hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, did anyone else have any more questions? We've, we have blown past <laughs> what we thought we were gonna run for tonight, but we were really enjoying the Q&A with all of you guys. Um, and we're definitely willing to stick around for some more questions if anyone has them. Um, we're here to give as much information as we can give. So, 
I see Bruce. Bruce has a question. Go ahead. Um, how did they know that it was um, 1140 at the, uh, the time the iceberg hit? Like, um, how did they know it was like 1240 or 1040 with the way the time changes kept popping up? That's a very good question. Yep. Yeah, Bruce, this one, uh, Quartermaster Hitchens, uh, who was at the ship's wheel when the berg was struck, uh, he actually testified there was the, in the wheelhouse, there was a, a clock that was on the magnetic system. And, and when um, Captain Smith came after the collision and Murdoch had said, note the time and enter it in the log, and Hitchens had stated that it was 1140. Uh, so that is a pretty clear uh, direct statement about that. And that would have been keeping the time uh, adjusted or unadjusted where they could see it uh, right there uh, yeah. in his proximity. Yeah. And that was official ship's time. Um, what's interesting about the magnetic system is that all of the clocks, they would jump at the same time at an impulse from the master clocks. But it also depended on where the hand had been left when the clock was first started. So I'm sure Mark will be able to speak to this. Um, when Olympic and Hawk uh, collided, the clock on the bridge and the clock in the engine room were supposed to agree on what time it was. That was actually in White Star's um, regulations. And yet we know that those two clocks showed a slightly different time, uh, at least for that day on Olympic. Now, We've done an extensive analysis and we put it into solving the mysteries on the, the impact time reported. Now, 1140 is what uh, was said about the bridge clock, but you have others, quite a few of them said 1142, 1143. Uh, I know one of those reports was off the magnetic clock that was in the smoke room over the fireplace. So, I mean- There was an 1146, I recall. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of room, but the official time. The other thing you got to keep in mind, though, is that that report was after the collision had ended, when Captain Smith came on the bridge and the time was supposed to be noted and put in the log. That was 1140, which kind of begs the question, could, it, could the collision have taken place at 1139? Maybe. I mean, we're, you're dealing in 60 second increments. It all happened very fast. Room for thought on why sometimes the commonly accepted is not always, when you stop and think about it, maybe maybe there's a little bit more depth to the story. Um, In Solving the Mysteries, we went into great detail on what time did the, did the Titanic hit the iceberg and what time did the ship actually sink? You talk to different people, you get different answers. But when you put all the accounts together, we came back to 1140 and 220. Yeah, that's those are the accepted times. It's a there's a little margin on the edges, but those are the accepted times. Now, you also asked how they kept track of time at sea. And I would very much encourage you to look at solving the mysteries, which is available on Blurb because we go into a lot of detail on that. That would be probably pretty boring for most of the people here. But in short, timekeeping was part of the navigation of the ship. So every day at noon, uh, 12 noon on the ship was local noon when the sun was directly overhead. And then that afternoon, the officers would computate uh, how quickly are we moving through the water? How quickly does that relate to speed over the surface of the earth? You know, when you're facing currents and wind, where do we plan to be at noon? tomorrow. And they knew their course very well. They knew how many nautical miles they would steam. Uh, they knew the currents very well. And so they would say, the clocks are going to have to be adjusted by X number of minutes so that at noon tomorrow, when the ship's clocks read 12, that's when the sun is directly overhead. And uh, there was testimony at the inquiry that if they had to make an adjustment, maybe they had to slow down for some reason or another, Usually the adjustment to the adjustment would only be a couple of minutes at most, and it would be carried out in the forenoon or the morning. So that's why Titanic's time does not equate to a specific time zone because it was part of their navigation. What time it was going to be at noon the next day 
according to the sun, which is what they navigated by, the sun and the stars, um, that very much depended on how fast they were traveling and where they were. So they would always make this, you know, educated guess, and they were really good at it. Um, and their adjustment in the morning, if they needed one, would be small. And we actually were able to take in solving the mysteries, and we put this back into recreating Titanic, the fact that they had a 47-minute clock adjustment scheduled for that night, running over Titanic's track equates to a specific location where they expected to be at noon the next day. And then it becomes a very simple matter of figuring out how fast the ship was traveling at that point, how what time she was likely to arrive in New York. And that's why it's very likely that she would have made New York the entrance to the channel at, you know, Tuesday evening and docked early Wednesday morning. Um, so it, it's a very complicated subject. A lot of the history on how they did that kind of thing has been lost and we tried to piece it back together for, for modern readers. But does that, uh, does that help answer uh, that question? Uh, that you had. Uh, let me let me find you again, and I will ask you to unmute. There we go. Does that help? Um. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay. Wonderful. All right, Nicholas. Uh, you have another question? Yeah. Hi. I have another question uh, regarding the crow's nest and the missing key to the binoculars. Um. I mean, I already follow you guys on on this topic, but I'm still wondering that. Like no, none of the officer came up with the idea. Like maybe we, they should get uh, one of theirs or something. Like I mean, I know they they weren't supposed to spot the iceberg with the binoculars, but still, <laughs> it feels like they should have gotten a different set. Yeah, that's a really good question, and there's been a lot of confusion over that. Uh, if you look at newspaper headlines, David Blair was the one who sank the Titanic because he had a key that supposedly locked away the binoculars. And, but as you point out, lookouts were not trained to use binoculars to spot objects. They would only use binoculars after the fact to help identify, but by then they were already supposed to have given their report to the bridge. The question really came up at the inquiries where many of the lookout men got behind this idea that well, we had no binoculars. We were supposed to have binoculars. Uh, we always had binoculars on other ships. Um, but you can kind of see why it would have been important for a lookout who might have felt some heat coming their way, especially when they're on the stand uh, in a class conscious society like it was in Britain at that time. And they're being asked, you know, when were your eyes tested last? Mm. Um in that kind of situation, you can see why it might be a little bit of a comfort to you to throw something like that out there. Well, yeah. we didn't have binoculars. Okay. I think maybe the next question would have been, were you used to using binoculars to spot icebergs at night? Um, is that, was that your standard operating procedure? There was a, 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 a documentary that came out called Seconds from Disaster a number of years ago which I thought was very, very interesting. They actually put a guy on the front of a Coast Guard cutter, I believe it was, on a dark night, uh, an expert, uh, I believe he was a naval officer, in the temperature conditions like Titanic was that night. And they had him stand out there and, you know, do, do binoculars help? And he stood out there with the binoculars, like, like Titanic's binoculars, and he said, they're useless. <laughs> they don't do anything. Um, yeah. And they, he also reported an interesting phenomenon that I had never heard brought up before, and which I think is actually very important to understanding what was going on. He said that from going through the cold air at the speed that Titanic was going, it, it created an artificial wind, and it was actually making his eyes tear up, mm. and it made it very difficult for him to actually see. Now, they were accustomed to that, but I think that played, you know, a lot more into that than any question of binoculars did, um, personally. Now, Tad and Bill may have some more to add to that, but that's just my, my read on it. No, I agree, and that, that seemed to be the opinion that, that if, at best, they would have been 
useful once an object was spotted to see what it was, but not for actually spotting it to begin with. That's my understanding too. And with that, I need to sign off. I have a wife that's waiting dinner for me and she's hungry. Yes. So <laughs> I'm done. Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. Talk to you later. You. Yeah. Um, there's also some question about what box the key was actually to. Uh, we know there was a box for the telephone and we know that a key to the crow's nest telephone has come up for auction accordingly, supposedly from David Blair. Well, we know the telephone worked and they were able to get at it on the night in question. Um, there's no question about that. So was there a crow's nest key? We know that there was a crow's nest phone box, but the whole thing has just been blown out of proportion. Does that, does that okay. make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank Thanks. You. Now, Rich has a question. Go ahead, Rich. I had a question about um, what you guys feel about the timing of the breakup. Um, I think, again, like, there, I think I, your Sea of Glass animation is probably like the closest in terms of like how it might actually have happened. It's very, you know, obviously quite different from the Cameron version where it kind of like, well, it splits in a different place and it also is like kind of a clean cut down the middle. I always wondered if like the breakup actually happened slower than it is usually depicted. I'm just curious what you guys think about that. Well, I, I'll let Kent handle this one. And uh, unfortunately, this will have to be my last question as well, because I have the, to get going. And um, I'll say in advance of that, just thank you to everybody that's joined in and for the other panel members that, that joined in. It's been phenomenal. But um, I know Kent will have a lot to say about this question, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the way it's been understood has changed over the years and years. And Cameron's movie is phenomenal for the standpoint that it's one of the first ones that really portrayed it breaking as opposed to sinking intact when you go back to A Night to Remember and SOS Titanic and all those old portrayals where it's still intact. Um, so I certainly can't criticize anything they showed in the movie, but um, even if he refilmed it, I believe he would do it differently now based on his expeditions after the, the movie came out. But it's a lot less clean of a break than what we previously believed. And um, I'll let Kent go from there because Kent can get into some of the forensic aspects to a certain extent. Um, but you're right. It, it wasn't a quick drop of the stern into the water and certainly wasn't just one break. It was multiple breaks. And that's what we tried to portray in the real time animation that it was very messy and extended much further aft. Um, and I'll let Kent take it from there, but yeah. You're right. Thank you very much, Ted, for all your input. And uh, it was great to be with you tonight. We have a lot of work ahead of us in the coming months. So uh, I know yes. I'll be talking to you soon. So um, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, okay. I, I'll go a little bit further uh, than what Tad said. Um, if you go back to the appendix and honesty of glass, that's that's what we pointed to. It was a messy breakup. Um, it's been known for years the primary break occurred just forward of the third funnel in the vicinity of the aft end of the lounge, the aft end of the dining saloon. If you look at the wreck, that's where it's all open. Um, clean cut, straight top to bottom. Your, your cleanest break is going to be your primary fracture. But behind that, you had eyewitnesses who said that the break was amidships. You had eyewitnesses said it was through the lounge. You had eyewitnesses that said it was forward to the third funnel. And then you had others who said it was back by the engine casing. It was back by the expansion joint. It was between the third and fourth funnels. And then you have others who say it was back in the vicinity of the fourth funnel. And one of the things that we tried to, to do with Honesty of Glass and later with our animation, I know that eventually we're going to revise it. We're going to improve the quality of some of the animations there. But we tried to show that it's known how the ship came apart. It wasn't clean. And when you couple it with the eyewitness statements about it involving such a large section of the ship, some of them said, you know, it fell, the, the middle part of the ship fell in. People fell into the decks. A shocking report uh, that we've, we've come across, you know, when the ship broke, they fell in. Um, we know the plunge started at about 2.15. That's when the ship's port side list eased and it took its dive at the head. 
We know from those on Californian that the lights snapped out at what equated to 217 Titanic time. So that's an eyewitness report at the exact time when you factor in the 12 minute time difference between the two ships. And we know that the ship sank at 220, according to some people's watches. Um, so you have five minutes from that plunge to when the ship disappears. And 217 being a, a primary break point where the lights tended to fail for the most part, um, it gives you about three minutes for the stern to settle back and then to be pulled back upright, swing around, achieve its maximum vertical uh, angle, and then dive out of sight with increasing speed. So that's what we tried to do in the 21 animation. I know, I know Levi is with us tonight. He was um, primarily responsible for bringing that animation to life for us in a very, very tight timeline. I know that he and I have talked and we've talked with Bill and Tad and our whole team. There's things that we would revise about it moving forward. Um, but up to this point, it's a very, very good merge of a lot of disparate lines of evidence on the timing of how things happen. Um, I think the basic timing of everything that we have in that animation, we would probably keep the same or very similar moving forward. Um, does that, does that help answer your question, Rich? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, definitely. Cause it's like reading some of the reports too, of just like the noise, like in the darkness of that just kept, it seemed like it went on for quite a while and it wasn't just like one quick point in time, I guess. Just no. imagine the steel like ripping apart, like it doesn't happen that fast. So yeah. We, we likened it to uh, the failure of the World Trade Center structures on 9-11. In, on a sea of glass, where you had elements of the structures take the load for a while after you know so much of the structure had been removed. But then over time, those elements were weakened to the point where they couldn't take the load. And that's when the primary you know, collapse began. It didn't mean that things weren't happening beforehand. In fact, Jockin uh, was in the deck pantry and he was, you know, he heard a rush overhead. So that's about 215, you know, when we know that would have happened on the boat deck above him. And he said he heard something. It sounded like metal giving way below him in that deck pantry. And he was, you know, right where the ship all came apart and tore itself to pieces. So it probably began, you know, 214, 215. And that's right. Maybe that had something to do with the plunge that the ship took, maybe coming back up on an even keel. Um, it, it started before that main visible break and it continued after the first break happened. You had a, a cascade of structural failures. It, I don't think there can be any question of that now. Uh, yeah, no, thank, thanks Kant, that definitely answers my question. Yeah, awesome, good, glad, glad to help. So gentlemen, I uh, will take one more question from Bruce and then I also have to go get my dinner. So let's, uh, Let's get Bruce's question and then we'll call it a night. Um, had the Titanic not taken that final plunge and went down slowly, do you think the ship would uh, have been destroyed like completely because the stern's implosion or whatever? Implosion is a term that's been thrown around a lot regarding the stern. Um, looking at the wreckage over the years, um, I don't think an implosion scenario would have accounted for most of the damage that's there. I believe that most of the damage that's visible at the wreck site today is the result of the breakup. Huge you know, pieces of steel that were shredded like paper, like the big piece that came up, that wouldn't have been happening that far after the primary break because of an implosion, you know, because those decks would have flooded very, very quickly when the stern was pulled upright and it was in a, in a nose down scenario, there's nothing holding the water back. Um, I believe, you know, some of the damage to the wreck visible today clearly happened on the way down to the bottom. There's, there's no question about that. Sorting out what happened as those pieces came down and what happened at the surface. That's why we give so much credence to what eyewitnesses said, because 
what they reported as an aggregate, as a bullseye pattern, matches what we see at the rec site today. And I'm sure we'll be going further into detail on that in the months and years ahead. I know that our breakup appendix for on a CU class, we have a lot more accounts, a lot more information than we did in 2011, 2012. And it's already been rewritten once, and we're going to be tweaking it some more as we move forward. Um, so hopefully that helps as far as we can help right now without giving everything away that we've been doing behind the scenes. So, Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was an awesome evening. We are, we are always so glad. I know, Doug, you've joined us before. Nathan's joined us before. Uh, so many other names I, I recognize. Martin Cahill is a Lusitania fan, joining us all the way from New Zealand. Um, Chris, of course, with his work on Titanic Blueprints and on the piano. And then, of course, I've got to give a shout out to Alex Mahler and Levi Rourke, our two animators at HFX Studios working under Tom's oversight. They have been fantastic to work with over a period of many years. It's been a pleasure to work with them. I'm always stunned at the quality of the work that they do. And you guys are going to be blown away when you see what they've done for Lusitania. It's going to be awesome. So thank you for joining us. Now, of course, there's going to be a recording of this very lengthy meeting that's going to be made available uh, probably on my YouTube channel after the fact. So we will be able to archive that so that people can reference it moving forward. And we hope that we... Um, we did Titanic and the people that were on that ship justice tonight uh, and helped preserve their memory and the history of that fact. Well, so thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna end the meeting now. Have a great night and stay safe, everyone. We'll plan on seeing you April 14th to 15th for the live stream. Take care. Bye.